announcing his royal majesty, King Marcus. Hello, yes, it's me. Today, we will be deciding if this is one of the best Super Sentai ever. Which king will come out on top? Which king will come out on bottom? Who knows? Let's find out on today of King Ogre's King Race. I'm also here to do a knighting ceremony. Mm. Oh, hi. Your Majesty. Well, let's go ahead and get this over with. Mm. Arise, Knight of Nightingham, yeah. Duke of Magnesia, yeah. Duke of Magnesia, yeah. something or other, and that's over. The following is a fan-based discussion. All properties discussed are property of Toei Inc., Bandai, Hasbro, and Subarai Productions. Hello everyone! Welcome to Tokocast Reviews, episode number 171. His Royal Majesty, King Marcus, Jacob the Earl of Sandwich. Today, we are here to review and discuss Osama Sentai, King Ojer, which has just finished. Last week, mm -hmm. I have been waiting for this! Four months. <laughs> As have I. Ugh. After hearing you hype it up for so long, and finally sitting down watching the whole thing. Ooh boy. Mm-hmm. Yes. I want to do this one a little bit differently. Okay. Because we're really going to focus on the characters in this one, but I want to focus on like some of the more aesthetic things at the beginning mm -hmm. to sort of make sure, one, that we talk about them, and two, I want to get those out of the way. <laughs> But first, it's always the start we always do. The, the opening. opening. It rules. They don't say King Ogier. They don't. It's they not say... even named King Ogier. Like, the song name isn't Osama Sentai King Ogier. Mm. It's just, I forget what the name of it is. But, yeah, it's it's not the name of the show. I really like how this song is structured. Yeah. I like how it opens and you got that nice guitar riff. Da -da 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 good instrumental opening. And then I like how it leads into the first verse. Mm -hmm. I like the way it sounds where it's more vocal heavy. The instruments are a little less, a little uh, more in the back. And then I like the bridge part leading into the chorus. The da -da 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 That's nice and fun. But then when you get into the chorus, that king of kings, that rules. I will say something though. Mm. I don't think this is a good insert song for a fight. I think Gira's insert song of Inferno, which is one of the greatest songs of this show, is probably the one that should play over intense fight scenes because it has that bombasticness to it that it seems like the opening doesn't. Mm, I think this one works. I don't think it does. I think it it has a little bit too much lightness to it that Inferno has a much more like a deeper darkness to it that really matches uh, the intensity of the battle. I think it depends on the fight scene. Not every yeah. not every action scene in this is like oh, heavy yeah. high stakes. I just don't think they should play it when they're fighting Dunbit. <laughs> I think that that should be saved. I think that's Inferno time. That, that's Inferno. Time. It's Inferno time. It's Inferno time. Um, let's talk about the suits. Uh, Beast Wars. They're great. They're great suits. They're great. So good. Peak suits. Peak aesthetic. First bug. Well, first full bug. First Sentai. full bug Sentai, yeah. Yes, we had beaten Stag and the Go Riders, mm -hmm. but yeah, this is just like, oh my god, the, this is great. The way it, the way they include the inclusion of the armor on the chest plate, the off the shoulder cape is really nice for most of them. Jeremy has because Jeremy's got his uh, waistcoat, waistcoat on the waist. Yeah, that looks good on him. The insect on the face plate. Oh, the I love that. Looks really good. And the shades they use for the colors. Yeah. I think that I think it's a good choice of, choice of color for, you know, it's a good shade of red. It's a nice dark shade of blue. Our first purple. Not violet. Purple. On the main team. Mm -hmm. It's like we're getting really uh, unusual team combinations now. You know, male pink. Uh, first purple. First orange and Boom Boonger mm. on the main team. Well, mm. second orange on the main team. Because Q-Ranger. But... Yeah, it's just... Curator, of course, had a huge team, so... Yeah, they did. They had to have multiple colors. Gold and silver were on the main on that one. Uh, there's no gold or silver six here. We yeah. have a white six ranger. I Freaking Jeremy, man. And we have a gray ranger. Yes, a gray ranger and uh, Okawagata Oger. It's just... The aesthetics are done so well. 
Uh, let's talk about the mechs really quickly. Sure. Uh, we have, you know, King Oger itself, God King Oger, Legend King Oger, mm. Extreme King Oger. The individual bugs as giant robots thing. As, yeah. in, as in, like, individually, like, when you see them in bug form, they look pretty cool. Yeah, it's also our first one with, like, more than five of, like, on the main. Map. Yeah, because there, there are, you have our main, you know, five rangers, and then you have, like, additional ones that come on, like, ladybugs and a couple spiders that, like, fill the rest of the armor yeah. out. Yeah, looks good. Yeah. I think the, I think the mechs in this... Um, we do get a clusterfuck, though. <laughs> We do, but I think story-wise, they justify it. Oh, yeah. It, it works definitely story-wise. It's just like, oh, my God. How does I, the person I, move? I didn't mind. I, I didn't was, mind. It was fine. It's just one of those things where I'm looking at it like, well, that's a lot. They also don't use it, but so much. Uh, Next in general in this show. 26, and then they just stop using it for a bit. So, let's see. 25, 26, 31, 41, 47, 48, just on a monitor, and then 50. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, they go ting and top at Gurren Lagan at the end with it. <laughs> we'll get that. I wanted to but be the first person to bring that up, damn you. <laughs> the Transcendent Storming Ultimate Perfect King Oger is the name of it. Yes. We'll talk about that more when we're, like when we really get into the characters and everything. Uh, because it just plays so much until the end of the show. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. Uh, Aesthetic-wise, there are so many good things. The monster designs are great. Um, the monsters have good designs, the minions have good designs, the orange and the blue with little specks of white and black really helps them pop against everything else and it sets them visually apart from our heroes. Plus they're not bad guys by the end of this show. The visual designs of the countries as a whole are yeah. instantly recognizable. You know, you're, in, you're in like a cyberpunk city, you're like, okay, we're in Kusapa, we're in more of an industrialized, little bit of clock punk, little bit of steampunk, that's Shugadom. Ishibana is just kind of like flowers. It's like it's like every Studio Ghibli film kind of smashed into one, just like European countrysides and like flowers and floral arrangements. Uh, and then we have what's the what's Rita's? I forget the name. Oh, Rita's is uh, damn it! Why am I blanking? Starts with a G. Is it Gokan? Gokan, thank you. Gokan is all ice. And then we have tofu, which is all fertile Japanese, like, rural farmlands. It's great. It's probably the one I would spend the most time at, in all honesty. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, how everything looks. It's, it's just, after how many other shows, and, you know, we've been doing this for how long, we've seen Lord knows how many toku, where no matter what is going on or where we're supposed to be said, we always seem to spend time in the same locations. Yeah. They've been changing it. Like, in recent years, they've changed it up, I think, in, I think in good ways. Yeah. I think Geats did a great job of doing this by setting it at, like, an abandoned theme park. Or here's a, you know, this, this rec room, this green room, different locations that we make good use of or we shoot them in an interesting way. And in this one, this is the first time, first production in Japanese history... TV production to use the volume set. Yes, that was st- that uh, the, Mandalorian. the Mandalorian used the three the three dimensional stagecrafts set, and I think for better th- there are some times where it's like okay, I think where are the shadows where the sh- the shadows are like someone is like moving really fast in front of the screen, and like you can see like the blur there so like yeah it's a little shaky in some parts but overall i think very well implemented yeah for for what the for the budget they were dealing with i think it works great yeah let's put this up actually a little bit differently we'll talk about the two halves because this is the first time that we have a time skip and it's in time yeah we do um Going so full shonen jump yeah we'll talk about one through 25 along with the movie because the movie is exceedingly important and um then we'll when talk was about the last time we were ever able to say that I'll give you a hint. We weren't. Ever. I don't remember the last time a movie was ever this important. Alba Ranger. I want to say. I don't remember. Because <laughs> that's where they got the mech. Uh, that other mech that they ended up using for a couple episodes near the end. Oh. Um, but yeah. 1 through 25. This is like the Bugnarok. The uh, Bugnarok arc. Yes. The Bugnarok arc where we get introduced to our main five. Learn Gira. Uh, who he is That's a little good. bit. I would call it our main six. Yeah. I would say it's the main six. It really is. Jeremy comes in like episode 12, 11 or 12. He comes in pretty early. Yeah. And he's there narrating from the beginning. Yes. We find is... out that he's the one who's been narrating the whole time. The greatest thing. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. 
Gira's up there playing the Tyrant King to Reckless Husty. Mm-hmm. Uh, this... So the way it opens, I mean, like, how do you want to dive into this thing? Just, just, just start with episode one? It, see where it takes us? Yeah, I don't want to, like, get too in-depth. I mean, the show just ended. Get too in-depth. It's our review. That's what That's we're here true. for. <laughs> but it's like, I don't just want to, like, oh, this happened in this episode. Then just go on from there. I want to, like, sort of do an overview of this arc. Okay, well, the overview is, well, as our show opens, we have uh, the other four kings coming to the kingdom of Shugodom, which is who King uh, Rakulis Husti is the current... Sovereign of this of this kingdom, yep. of this country, mm-hmm. and he's like, "I've gathered you here for the purpose of you must submit to me, and you know we will form an alliance where I am at the head." And they're like, "Well, I don't know about that," but then it's not even I don't know about that. They're like, "Ha ha!" So some of them are, but like, yeah, it's like troubles are brewing, and then all of a sudden, the bug because like the, we open with like a there's like a monologue, but like the prophecy of the Bugnarok army returning after you know hundreds of years, they will be back. And sure enough, they are, uh, led by Emperor Deathnarok the Eighth. Yes. Of the Bugnarok Empire and his uh, vizier. What's what's the vizier's name? Kamejim. Kamejim, thank you. Uh, so they're uh, we're off to the races, and it's the opening is like straight out of Attack on Titan. Yeah, it where, really is. Where this... we where we have a walled city, and we have these. We talked about this in our first impressions, and you have these giant monsters coming towards. Smashing through the walls, there's panic in the streets, everyone's running around, and they give you a good sense of, like, scale and what's going on, and I was wondering, is this going to be, like, a one-time episode thing where we blow all our budget in the first episode and hook you with our good ideas, and then scale it back, because this has happened many times before in Toku, uh, not the case in this one. I love how after that first episode, people on Twitter were asking the We, ne- we never see a battle of this scale with this many people, I think. Like, throughout the rest of the show, but, like, they still, I think, are able to carry the sense through. People on Twitter were asking the production team, like, how much does this cost? And the production team was like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about the budget. (laughs) It was was one of the series directors. Yeah. Like, don't worry about that. Don't worry. We got that. Don't worry. They spent their money wisely, I think. Yeah. But then, um, Gira, who is our Red Ranger... Yes. Goes, to, goes to the castle, pleads with the king. Well, hey, he's out there being an actor. He's playing the tyrant he's, king. He's playing with some kids, yeah. And he's an orphan. Mm-hmm. Goes up and just like they start attacking and then see that Reckles really isn't doing anything. Because Three it, of the other kings are. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're they're on the ground in their uh, King Oger uh, royal Suits. arms. Yes. Fighting, oh, Buso. Mm-hmm. Fighting away. I love the fact that the transformation device in this is just a straight up sword. Uh, going from that to Boom Boonger is it's like three years in a row of weapons being used as changers, mm. and this time it isn't. So it's just a little odd because <laughs> it's just a wrist changer. Well, as long as it's good, yeah. But yeah, he pleads with him to do something, and he chooses not to. And then something flips in Gira, and he decides, "Well, if you won't, then I will, and I will become king." And then he steals the sword, steals the royal arms, the sword. He's able to transform into the into a uh, Kugata Oger, yep. who is the Red Ranger. Uh, actively wake up Kuogon, who's been sleeping forever. Mm-hmm. Which is our red mech for the show. Yes. And yeah, that's that's how our first episode starts. And then he's off. He summons the mech. They're able to fight, and then he gets carried off to Nkosapa yeah. by Jan Magast, who is our Blue Ranger. The, Tombo. F- yes, the first Tombo Oger. 25 episodes of this are really Shugat focused, and then it stops being that. Um, but yeah, the first half of this show is just like, you know, really going to focus on the mechs mm-hmm. and really push those to the forefront. Uh, this almost outsold uh, Don Brothers, but they had like nothing in the third quarter bar uh, a new Curies and, mm. and stuff. So <laughs> but yeah, the first couple episodes is just Gira sort of getting kidnapped. He gets kidnapped and taken from kingdom to kingdom as we're introduced to every country's king. And we're kind of introduced to what their deal is and how they're viewed by their people and uh, what their, what their like overall outlook on life is. Especially Kaguragi di Boski. King of Tofu. I love his introduction. The man is a schemer. And that is his entire thing. He is very theatrical. Very showy, very grand. Very kabuki theater. Yes. And he's great. He's so Like great. everyone else in the show. 
Everybody in this show is going to have so many acting roles after this. My I hope, God. I hope so. My God, are they just going to get inundated. I hope. I, really <laughs> I hope, hope so, too. Everybody deserves an exceedingly fruitful career. They were trending on Twitter every single week. People were going insane. It <laughs> trended, like, because usually on Twitter it only lasts for a couple hours, but at least for the finale of King Yoder, it lasted for, like, a good day and a half. Oh, wow. So. <laughs> One thing that... I don't know that we talk about in a lot when we do our reviews is mm-hmm. casting. Yeah. Like, we'll talk about characters for sure and talk about performances here and there, but I don't think it can be understated just how perfectly cast every role in this show is. I could not agree more. I don't think there's ever been a Sentai or, like, Toku show that I've ever seen that has been this pitch perfectly cast. It was funny because I remember uh, like reading some of the behind the scenes stuff. Mm. Gary's actor um, was like last, hmm. but he embodied it so well. And then Jeremy's actor was also apparently like he wasn't even really supposed to be there, <laughs> like in the same fashion. Like he was supposed to be there, but it's not like, yeah. in the same way. And then he came in wearing white, and the director was like, "Yes." <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's how we got at least a couple of them. And, you know, Rita's actor, they really lauded for Rita's actor because Rita, the character is a, you know, a person with no gender. They are, their gender is Which the, the story, the story reason how they work that in, I find fascinating. Mm. Because her character is a judge. Yes. She is, she, they, they sorry, uh, the the actress is, is, is she, my, my apologies. Uh, so they, they uh, Rita is the judge of all of... Chiku. Gokan and Gokan, Chiku, whatever yeah. you want to, whatever, like this whole planet. The king of Gokan, the judge of Chiku. Yes. And the way they characterize them, I remember telling you this after I'd started watching the show. I was like, I swear, if anything happens to this precious baby, I will kill everyone in this room and, and then myself. <laughs> Because I love them so much, and I want nothing bad to happen to them. And the, the the idea of, oh, they don't have a gender because they have to erase all bias mm. of any kind and, like, purge it from them completely. So, like, the, like the, the judge is not even assigned a, uh, a gender, and it was the same way with their predecessor. Yeah. Who was, I believe, their mother? Uh, no. But but the previous judge, yeah, the, the previous, previous judge, judge, the previous king. They, they it's something that they actually state in the second part of this show where Rita's parents is alive and they go visit them fairly frequently. <laughs> Just like, well, you have a healthy relationship with your parents. That's nice. <laughs> it's better than everyone else in this show. It's true because <laughs> they're either dead or you know something evil was afoot. Rita's just out there vibing with the parents every couple of days. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Either them or Poor Malfoon. thing, she's always working. Or Malfoon. Malfoon. That, I, I think the moment I really fell in love with this character is early on in the show where she's in, her, they. they are in her, they're in their room mm. and they're like rolling around on the ground. <laughs> Just rolling back and forth, arms outstretched. Da, 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 da. Voicing Malfoon. Yes, they they talk to Malfoon, they do the voice. Uh, as a way to like you know vent and try and figure things out. They had a little short for a little while for mm-hmm. Mothman, like outside of the show. They just made a short for Mothman. <laughs> God, the 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 animation that they use for so that good. for that. Sh- I love a short. I it really looks like it. Yamishibai. It's like yeah. genuinely kind of unnerving. But I'm here for it. I love it. But Mothman him, himself is kind of cute. Yeah, Mothman's great. Uh, you know we get. We are introduced to all of their retainers mm-hmm. throughout this. And Gira's sort of... He's being the Tyrant King from the play that he's playing. Yeah. But, one, the other people are getting annoyed. Uh, two, they're calling him out on it. Three, he's sort of being shuttled off to each place because they sort of want to get rid of Rackley's as well. Uh, it's but, like, yeah, we want to get rid of him, but we don't really want you here. Yeah. We don't know what your deal is yet. How do, how do we, you know, figure out what you're about? What crimes are you guilty of? Because Rackless is accusing you of things. You stole the sword. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
But Rackley's does have the Ultra Caliber Zero, which is originally, it's the original one. It's the original sword Mm -hmm. that was given to them by somebody we'll talk about in a second. But it was given to them, and Yanma, or I guess his predecessor, ended up making all of them. Mm -hmm. Like, making the copies, and that's how we ended up getting the King Ultra ones. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yes, I believe so. That one's a little bit weird on how they specifically said how did they get those. Yeah, so Yanma ended up creating those. Uh, They're all Mm bio-locked. Which... Only those of royal blood can use them. Yes. Which means if Gear is able to do it... Yeah. Then he must be be of royal blood. Yeah. And uh, they they also... One thing that Yanma brings up is he can communicate directly with the Shu Gods. Yes. He is able to directly communicate with them and he can Gira and he, Gira and Gira can directly control them. Yeah. And if the king of all things technology, the president of Inkosapa, is telling you those things cannot be hacked. Yeah. You cannot fake this. So like, yeah, this guy's legit. That's one of the things I love about Yanma is he's he's like got Gira's back from the beginning. He had like a slight crush on Himino, but then he interacted with her and that ended. So <laughs> I still think the relationships between everyone in this show. Oh, yeah. I think everyone's great. Um, The way they all interact is great. Yeah, the first 25 episodes really just them, you know, really it's... The first 25 episodes is the most Sentai thing of this show. Mm. And then the rest happens and that stops. But, uh, but yeah, the first 25 episodes of them just, you know, going through all of this. There's a fight between Rackles and Gira, which Rackles just straight up stomps him. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a whole poisoning aspect. Oh, God. (laughs) One of the funniest moments in the whole show. Well, it, there's sort of two ways that this ends up happening. But I have to talk about the poisoning. Wait, so they were labeled? Oh, they were labeled! Bleed! Blah, blah. <laughs> they digitally alter his eyes to blink really fast. Uh, there's also sort of like two illusionists in this. We have one with Kami Jin, mm. which happens a little bit later. Uh, but the first one is Garo Jean. The best boy in the show. He's so good. This is the Mayfly, correct? Yes. I freaking love Garajim so much. He's yeah. such a good boy. He's such a good boy. The actor, the voice performance. It's it's unlike anything we've really heard before. Yeah. In It's sort of like echoey. It's sort of high. The, the way the way they like modulate it a little bit to make it sound a little echoey, yeah. but it, like the pitch and the pitch and the cadence that he uses to speak. Yeah. I'm a mayfly. I'm both here and everywhere and I'm, nowhere at once. I am both dead and alive. It is. It's it's kind of like him from Powerpuff Girls. A little bit. It's that it's that kind of cadence. Yeah. That kind of sing-songy him is high-pitched perfect. sing-songy cadence. Him is perfect. Him is the blueprint <laughs> <laughs> for all of the gender non-conforming people out there. And him is the blueprint. <laughs> but yeah, Garrowgen is just like, we did not expect him to, one, to last. Because he, do, no, he, he does end up getting destroyed, basically, in the second More episode. or less, but then uh, Jeremy saves him. No, he uh, he sort of goes Well, he does get saved by Jeremy. No, hold on. He goes, like, sort of out of control. Mm. And that's when he grows big and, like, gets, like, the poison and everything put into him and... But that was just an illusion. Mm. He didn't die. Yep. So he just made that himself. And then he decided to uh, defect and join Jeremy's side later on. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, the first 11 episodes of this is really just, uh, you know, all about the the politics, dealing with Gira. Learning about the politics, learning about Gira's uh, history, or like at least the start of it, because we learn a lot more later. Yeah. And um, it's, it's, we're we're seeing everything through Gira's eyes at first. And we're learning more, we're learning about the other kingdoms, we're learning about the role they play in Shikyu. And the rainbow Jirudida mm. that he ingested at some point when he was a kid. Mm-hmm. He doesn't remember a lot from when he was a kid. But yeah, he remembers eating that. And that's sort of one of the first things in the episode. They're tr- he's trying to make that again. Mm-hmm. And he couldn't do it. Which when you see it, it kind of looks like jello that's yeah. been diced top with sugar in the raw. Yeah. Uh, it looks like what they were used for on set. Yeah. That looks tasty. Yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, these first 11, uh, 11 episodes, and then Jeremy comes in. Jeremy. Is the boy. Jeremy is the best Sixth Ranger ever. To the I, best I'm, sa- I'm calling it right now. I think he's the best Sixth Ranger ever. 2,000 years old. 
Um, had a mask on. Yes, had a mask on, Spider given mask. to him by his parents because his parents were the original Six King. That was uh, because that was of, erased from history. Erased from history because he fell in love with with a Bugnarok. Yes, and he is a child of two worlds. Yes, the king of in between. King of the Unwoven. Uh, we find out near the end of the first part that he's actually Desdemona's cousin. And his mother was killed uh, because she beat Digorg, mm-hmm. uh, who was like this. Who was a big, scary general yeah. man on Bugnarok's side. And as we learn later, she is broken. So, <laughs> But then she ends up getting swarmed by all the minions for the at the time. Mm-hmm. And that's how she ends up getting killed. Um they end up locking his face away behind... Behind a spider mask. Yes, behind a spider mask. It's her venom mixture that she gave him. And uh, his father, you know, he had the six uh, osier caliber. Mm-hmm. This show, the way they set up so much at the beginning is sort of unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of it, everything pays off. And it's insane. Yep. There's this one girl early on that is like stuck in a wheelchair... Um, yep, and the, this is an episode three, I believe, which is Himino's yeah. introduction episode. Yeah, she's stuck in a wheelchair, and you know, Himino, like her first introduction to Himino is just like super selfish and everything, but she is doing it for the betterment of, of her people. Mm-hmm. She's selfish on the outside and selfish on the inside, but it's for it's for a good cause. I'm gonna take this off. She's now. altruistically selfish. Yes, Sebastian. Oh, Sebastian. Morphonia. We're going to really get into this. I, I sort of want to get to the second half because a lot of throughout the first half, it's uh, a lot of manipulation. Being there's done there's a lot of here. manipulation. There's a lot of double crosses. There's a lot of Gira trying to figure out where he fits into this. There's also the fact because of it because Because early on, like before the time skip happens, Gira does defeat Rackless. He becomes king yeah. of Shugadam. And... But he's still stuck in that mindset of like, I have to play the Tyrant King, I have to do this, I have to do this. The and there's a great episode, the festival episode, where the king, the kingdoms all come, come together, they throw a uh, little festival in Shugadam. With Joffrey. With, <laughs> yeah. From Toys R Us. Well, no, that's, that's later, that's later. Uh, that's much later, but still. <laughs> there's also, uh, we find out that Bolshimar, I love the fact that they, uh, they present... Gira is really stupid. He doesn't get an actual brain blast until the end of the show. But other people will notice things. And Boshimar and Kami Jim do like the same hand thing. Hmm. And I can't remember who notices it. But they end up realizing... I think it's I think it's um, Kagaragi. Yeah, probably. Because he winds up giving him the lance. Yeah. And, and replaced it with a fake one. Yeah, Kami Jim is exposed as Boshimar because apparently who is one him. of the king's uh, one advisors. of the king, one of the king's advisors slash I think he calls like, like the sword of the king. Yeah, one of the king's two swords. Him and Doga. Yeah, is the other guy. The sword and the great sword. Um, yeah, it's Kami Jim has been Boshimar this entire time. Has been uh, whispering in the king's ear and Rackless's ear this whole time. Yeah, and uh, this is prior to the festival episode I was talking about. But yeah, and then um, he is defeated, sends him, you know, off a cannon into the, dra- into the jagged rocks below. Racklesses. And uh, yeah, Racklesses. And because all this time, uh, prior to this, Reckless has been, you know, on the broadcast telling everyone in all the kingdoms that Gira is, you know, a traitor, a wanted criminal, bring him in, he must be punished. And everyone in Shugadon believes this, but then Reckless's crimes are broadcast for all to see. And uh, Gira becomes king. And in the festival episode, getting back to that, that was gr- that was there's a great moment towards the end of that where he's Gira is unsure of how to because he, he's still stuck in that I have to be the tyrant king mindset and not sure how to like actually be king because there's like two uh, orphan friends of his yeah the uh, the older girl girl and the younger kid the guy who doesn't age. In between the two parts? That was weird. I mean... It's been two the years. O- the only ones who really do are the rangers, and that's only just... And it really that's just, just it just comes down to a change of haircut. But and it's like, an outfit in some cases. For him, he was a little kid. It was just like, you expected him to grow at least a little bit. It didn't bother me. Uh, yeah, they, we end up... <laughs> I, I have to get back to the finish. Sorry, I just don't want to finish this thought. Okay, so he's unsure of how to re- interact, and the, the kings, he... Because he's kind of like off to the side, unsure of what to do. And the other kings are like, just, you got to get out there. You got to be yourself. You don't have to keep playing this role. You don't have to keep 
being the evil king. Like, you can call yourself that if you want, but at the end of the day, you have to be Gira. Yeah. And that's who we, and that's who we trust. That's who's king now. And that really helps him to start, you know, come out of his shell and grow into his role as king. My favorite episode, well, one of my favorite episodes, actually my favorite episode is in the second part, and I think you might know which one it is. We'll, we'll get to it. Uh, but Unless you want to get to it now. No, because it's in the second part. But it's like, Desenrock is sort of going full balls to the wall and going to destroy everything. Oh, I loved this yes. part of the story, because one thing we don't see a lot from our villains is nihilism. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of you know. I am bad. Bad is good. Therefore, I am good. I'm gonna take over the world. I'm gonna do the bad things because that's what I do. Because I'm bad. And then it gets to a point with with Emperor Death and Rock the Eighth where he's just like, you know what? If I can't, have I don't think can. if I can't have this, nobody can. So I'm just gonna blow the entire planet up. After another monster had previously dug down to the center of the earth, mm-hmm. um, or center of got to the planet's place. core. Yeah, the planet's and core. I love this whole thing because it's, Jeremy tries so hard to stop him. He tries for to talk him down for a good chunk of the first, you know, act that we're introduced to him because because he is a child of two worlds. He doesn't want there to be fighting on either side. Yeah, he wants he wants to be the peacekeeper. He wants to Which he like, wants everyone to get along. And he also doesn't want his stuff to be used improperly. Yeah, as we learned with the whole whoopee cushion thing mm. that Yanma tried to pull. Uh, but yeah, he's. He really tries to... It's his family. And yeah. he doesn't want anything bad to happen to Desenrock. Mm-hmm. So he you know, he basically ends up trapping the other King Ogers. Um, and tries to talk his cousin down. Mm-hmm. And, but that doesn't work. So this is... I mean, we have the whole thing with God Scorpion because of the Wrath of the Kings. That happened 15 years before The Wrath this. of God. And it, uh, Wrath of God and uh, a lot of people were killed. Which was a big, just this big cataclysm event where the sky was filled with cicadas. Yeah. And just death was everywhere. Himeno lost her parents. Uh, lots of people died. To a man in a cloak. Mm. And which, who she originally thought was Jeremy. Who she also originally thought was responsible for the whole thing. Yes. Uh, because Jeremy, when he first shows up, is in a cloak. Mm. Uh, but it was not him. No. Uh, it was in a fact sweet else. boy, he would never do that. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Jeremy is mostly just been a storyteller. He was asleep for a whole year. Yeah. He was put up in a museum as a living corpse. <laughs> so he was just like, okay. Yeah, I guess I'll do this now. that's me. Uh, yeah, Jeremy's introduction to this really t- ends up turning a lot of the story on its head. And even mm-hmm. though it comes in early, we've learned so much mm-hmm. by this point. And then, you know, things just sort of keep happening, especially around him afterwards. Mm. It's just so interesting how the story is really built. This is the first time the writer has like written for a Tokyo and he really goes in he was he was a drama writer yeah prior to this and man does it show <laughs> <laughs> the, the ups and downs possible. the story that Jeremy told 2,000 years ago they got written down which more or less ended up becoming uh, the story of how everything went mm. for a time um, until more revelations in the second half of the show really ended up bringing everything together mm. um, but yeah it's just it's really fantastic. It's but, um, so good. To get to the end of the... Um, to get to the end of this, we actually have to talk about the movie. I was gonna, I was going to say before that. Oh, okay. Before that, we have our... Or do you want to talk about the movie first, or do you want to talk about... I guess we can talk about the movie first. Yeah, because the, the movie and the history of Rackley's end up having... History of Rackley's happens at the beginning. And that's the whole thing with Rackley's backstory. I was talking about more about the final showdown with Death and Rock. But oh, the movie happens before that. That's why I was yeah. saying we should get to it first. But yeah, I do want to t- touch on the story of Rackley's because the characters from that end up showing up mm-hmm. later on in this. Um, this is where the uh, King Ogre Zero shows up uh, and all of the fake uh, uh, shoe gods mm-hmm. that end up forming King Ogre Zero. Rackley's tries to take over the other King Ogres for a little bit, which he can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Kuwa got a zero. Royal blood. Yeah, Kuwa got zero. Uh, can take over the other Shugas for a period until I believe Yanma ends up stopping that from happening. But the story of Rackless is just like how we ended up getting to that point. And, you know, the first showing of uh, Oh, Kuwa got a mm. But the movie with Devonica mm. and what is the name? Hakabaka. The Land of the Dead. Hmm. Where we end up seeing a Reynold. The first. 
Yes. In the line of of, of a Gira's bloodline. Yep. I really like this movie. It's good. Yeah, it's quite the good movie. Uh, especially we get to see... It's some good world building, some good lore, some good... Uh, it's got a good villain. Yeah, the villain... The villain's got a cool look. The villain isn't completely a villain. Because it's something that happens at the end of the show. Yeah, true. But for, for the intents of this movie, yeah. But this is also the first time they really get to see the previous rulers. Mm. Especially Iroki. Who we will go into so much more in my favorite episode of this goddamn show. Mm. But yeah, end of the first half. Uh, it's basically just get I, everybody together. Yeah, we get every, like literally we get everybody together because Death and Rock has this gone like to the th- this gone to the center, but also we have like prior to that we have Digorg who has grown to massive size. Oh. To massive size. King Caucasus Kabuto. And this is how we get uh, the big mech. Which is the castle. Mm-hmm. And... It chops him in half. Yeah. The the um, plot device of the, the impending doom. Mm-hmm. Like, in three days' time, your, your country shall be smitten from the earth. Because Digorg, the one-hit kill general, will... He's just standing there with his arm raised, ready to attack. And, like, as soon as, like, the sun sets on the third day... He will slash down, and Shugudam will just be wiped off the map because he will destroy it. He got resurrected a little bit earlier in the show. Yep. Because, as we said, Jeremy's mother killed him. Mm-hmm. Before she got killed by literally everybody else. Uh-huh. And we have a great, great episode where we we discover that Shugudam Castle is actually a mech that can transform, and we could, use, is... we could use that to make an even bigger mech, and that's how we can stop him. We just got to put all the gears and everything together. This we is ne- also... The f- dude, I love this this so much because it hasn't been used in like two thousand years yeah. or however long it's been, and it's like it can't do it. It's like this is an actual piece of machinery they that's rusted, and they all like all the rest of the pieces just fell apart. Yeah, like gears all fall off. So uh, Gira makes a plea to all the citizens. You know, get every gear you can find. Not bring just it all t- the citizens, really, just the entire world. Well, yeah, but like bring everything here, and we'll fix everything. And they do. Yeah. And it's great. And it ends with this great moment of him, you know, laughing as the evil king, victorious. And he's like, all of you are gears. And everyone gets upset at that, justifiably so. But then, <laughs> but like, he he gets out of the mech, he runs to this crowd at this angry mob. He's like, wait, 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 what I meant. What I meant was, all of us are gears that move this country. And without every one of you here... We, we it would have fallen apart and we never would have won so thank you also before we and actually, they all like hoist him up and in, in hoorays and it's it's wonderful before we get to the end because something else has happened during this uh beginning portion because we spoke about the lance earlier but uh okua got a king okua got a Oger yeah. and king kua got a Oger. Mm-hmm. um yeah it's a big gold power up big power up for for the red ranger yeah. because it can and i love how they integrate this into the story because it's like, well, why does only the Red Ranger get the power up again? Because only someone of this bloodline can use it. So, only uh, either Gira Reckless. or Reckless can use this yeah. one. I personally like this a little bit more on Reckless. Because it breaks up the pure gold that Gira has on his. It's just one color. I don't After Gira gets it. I like the split up between the gray and the gold hmm. on Reckless version of it. And then it all just ends up coming down to Kakaragi backstabbing Rackley's in the end of the day. He's playing both sides like a fiddle. Just just using his charm and gravitas to manipulate his way through every and situation. His sister. Because his sister is Mar- Suzume is married to Rackley's. Yes. Uh, he is out here playing uh, 4D chess. Pretty much at all times. When it seems like everyone else is playing checkers. Except for somebody, but we'll get to that in the second half. Uh-huh. <laughs> Somebody else is out here playing 60 chess. <laughs> but we have a our final battle where we have a great moment where Gira is actually able to bridge the gap with Death and Rock. And it there it looks like a moment there where it looks like they actually might be able to bridge peace, but then what comes flying out but that pin? Oh my Kamejimu's, god. Kamejimo's weapon, which is a pin. That was the I remember when everybody was watching it, we were like, what? <laughs> And Couldn't believe it. It was honestly wild. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but 
Jesus. It was a little bit heartbreaking yeah. at that point because he really didn't want anything to happen to Death Rock. It was just like he felt like he could do nothing. The way the way he was able to bridge it with Death Rock and when like it's like him and Jeremy are both holding him and he finally drops his sword and is like ready to acquiesce and ready to let go of his anger and move on and then just chunk nope. Especially with the way that Rackles was going about it earlier where he was like sort of subservient mm. to them. They were just like, oh, I'll sell off all the people to the Death Rock Emperor, uh, Empire in order to get power and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. When we get to the character reviews for this, mm-hmm. I have so many things to say about that man. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Anyway, uh, actually, that man could the, refer to a lot of people. At the end of the movie, um, that's actually the first time that we get to see Dag Dead, where he goes down to the land of the dead and kills Raynal. He can't really kill him, he's already dead. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I believe that was only in the director's cut, which came out after this. So. I don't think that's what I saw. It was after the credits. So if you didn't say it after the credits, that's why. I think I did, but I think it might have been a different scene. Maybe. Yeah, because uh, this is the first time we see Dag Dad. Mm-hmm. Dick- that is our main villain for the second half of the show, because it opens, we get a... It's two years have passed, and... I actually really like the fake out they pull here. In, t- in terms of, here's, time skips generally I really don't like. Mm. Generally, really not a fan because, Naruto. well, I've, you can say it. I've never watched Naruto. I mean, I've I'll watched it. it, but not that much. I'll say it. I've said it. The, big, <laughs> the biggest problem I have with a lot of time skips is what happens in between usually amounts to, well, everyone stopped being friends, or this couple broke up, or whatnot. We have to create some kind of drama, so... No, they just all got arrested. <laughs> some of them did. Some of them did. And Kira didn't, but the others did. <laughs> well, Rita didn't. Rita... Rita checked check themselves in for exhaustion. No, they didn't do that. Yeah, that's, Morphonia is no, that, no, that's what they say in the, in no, the title at the end. Ex- Morphonia said that the reason that uh, Rita more or less ended up getting arrested in this case is because they broke labor laws. Mm. <laughs> so they had to be arrested. So well, I'm, I'm, ref- arrested. I'm referring to what is what is actually on the thing. So. Yeah. Morphonia just said that. Well, yeah, it, ter- it turns out all four of the other ones just kind of did something stupid so they were in jail. <laughs> It wasn't like oh they've been in jail for two years. No, they've been in there for maybe a week or two. They were Who just knows? Really fucking stupid. And they just did. So they all just did. Like uh, Yanma invented a supercomputer that was like dangerous. Um, Himeno set off fireworks that were causing wildfires. Um, one of them invent. Uh, it was Kagaragi invented a plow that was like too dangerous, and then. Rita was checked in for exhaustion. And it was like, no, they just did something stupid, but now they're out. And it was, it's only been like a week, but their attendants have been running in their stead. Yeah. Sebastian wearing a fat suit. Oh Sebastian wearing a fat suit is like peak. It was too funny. Because um, like you see him riding the elevator and his pants are like completely unbuttoned and he's just like, oh goodness, oh boy, I'm fat. And it was it was just a because like he goes back to normal, but like that, and it was just a funny little change. I think a lot of the second part is really going to be being put into character mm. descriptions. I always feel like we can almost start that now because so much to, although we do end up getting to meet the other jesters. After Doug Dead. Because our main villain for the second half of the show is the space bug king, Doug Dead Dujardin. Dig Doug. <laughs> they can never pronounce his name correctly. I think it's the funniest part because he hates that. Um, but his introduction, when he's taking Gura to like all these other planets and all the destruction that he's put. When he, when he, because he has the ability to just teleport pretty much anywhere. Yeah. He, is the, he truly is like an all powerful villain. Yeah. The bug king of space. His. His lair is like the cosmos. Yeah. It's just like a big void in the cosmos with, with a like source wall. with like Dude, yes! <laughs> I thought the same thing. With the freaking source wall there. And and just like there's black holes and celestial bodies and all this stuff and the way they use like like practically they use like cellophane yeah, to wrap mean, around props so they could like digitally remove them, but like you can still kind of see yeah, where, where the are. things are, but you can also see like through them. A swing them. and a ball. A swing, a stuff. ball, a couch, a kotatsu, you know, whatever you what have you. And yeah, it's it's a un the and the way that like space is just 
kind of undefined in there the way you can't tell like there is no floor there is no ceiling there's no walls like really so it's just it, it just gives you a great like weird sense of space sort of and i like it of, it's uncanny um, it's sort of in a good of, way the base of the Byram from Jetman, hmm. where they have like that blank that blank space, people are like sometimes upside down and just walking on walls. Yeah, it really reminds me of that. But just like a little a Inception, much, a little MC Escher, just like space and time and laws of physics, just are, are weird here. It's so wild to just see, like especially comparing even those two, so Jetman and this, like sort of the same thing, but technology has just advanced so far. Mm-hmm. And Dig Dug doesn't like to do any. Well, he. He gets bored. He gets bored very easily because if you're that powerful, yeah, like doing things yourself isn't any fun because yeah. you can do it so easily. So he has the five jesters, and he has his five yeah. jesters, and Kamijima is back. Kamijima was one of the jesters, and Hirubir, he Goma, Mignonen, uh, and one that's not there right now. One that isn't there as of yet, but what he what he really wants to do is he wants to tidy up. He's like, Chikyu, things are a little too nice right now. I want you two to fight for my amusement, but you're not doing that, so we're going to have to do some tidying up, as he calls it. A.K.A. genocide. <laughs> Pretty much wants you to take out each other. And I just, like, th- that first... I'm, episode the first, 26. The first couple episodes of this arc are... We have to keep up the keep up this facade of, like, arbitration and anger against each other... You have Jeremy playing uh, playing the role. It's like, aha, I am, there yet. I am here for Bug Rock again. Because that episode is wild. But I remember when uh, episode 26... Well, that was, happens pretty early on. I know, it's episode 29. But episode 26 is one of the wildest things because I remember watching this with people. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just like going from Desnardoc to this scale mm-hmm. and it feeling like something that was logical. Mm-hmm. Because Dig Dug has been there the entire time. <laughs> And he's been. You keep calling him. It's, it's it's fair. He's dead now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he keeps. God, where do I want to even go with this? He sort of orchestrated to, everything between the. To start Death off where we begin, this. when we start off with Emperor Death and Rock. Yeah. When we first see him, which I mean, also great design. We didn't talk about him, but he looks oh, he I looks amazing. Him. His character is great. It looks great, but when we first meet him. And Kamijimu and their army of bug minions. It feels very familiar. Yeah, like this. Not, this feels like two. Uh, it, it, it's two. <laughs> two. You you look at many of the Sentai that have come before, and two. and two is an example. Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. Anyway, <laughs> so you look at you look at what has come before. You look at this, and immediately it feels recognizable. Yeah, it looks it looks like okay. So even if we are in a fantastical realm, even if we are doing things like using the volume and using this new technology to create these new settings and different you know character designs like we've never seen before, we still have the skeleton there of something that we can recognize. Yeah. And then we have our time jump, and then when Dagnet shows up. And he is warping Gira above this celestial frozen hellscape. And Gira is like, oh, I forgot you can't breathe. Zhunk gives him like an oxygen bubble and it allows him to like breathe in, in the vastness of space. It's so wild. It feels like, uh, for and, those of you who have played it, it feels like Ed Walker in Final Fantasy XIV. Because <laughs> that got so, it feels like that scale jump was accurate between the two. Mm. And it feels just like, oh, I've seen this. How are they going to do this in here? Hmm. But yeah, we, we go from something that is familiar, but like boosted up to a scale and with technology we haven't seen before. And now we're using said technology and it's like, okay, what's something that Sentai has like never been able to do before? What, what kind of villain, what kind of organization, what kind of threat can we bring in? And what, ki- and what kind of things can we do with our heroes and the answer is that cosmic- we haven't seen before? And the answer is cosmic horror. <laughs> I gotta say, I love Dagdad's design. Yeah, and the designs of his, of the jesters, the, as, the jesters as well. They're all based on bugs. I love how they look, and one of the things is they Dagdad in particular reminds me of the Xenomorph from Alien, mm. with that see through dome on the top of his head, where his actual body is, or his brain, or like whatnot. No, it's his actual body. His body is a little water bug. Yeah, with his orange uh, casing. It's 
fascinating the way they design these jesters and what mainly the alien ones because Dacton in particular like doesn't have a face. No. There's no like you look at him and he has a giant pompadour. He he has the big old pompadour, but he also has like the eyes and the hands, a little bit of pen labyrinth yeah. there. But like you're never quite sure where he's looking or what it or like where you should be looking on him. But he can always see you. Yeah. Like he's always watching. And that's I mean, to go back to Jeremy, that's another thing I loved about him as well. In terms of in terms of the in terms of his acting, but we can get there. Oh God! But yeah. uh, but when we get to the character. But uh, is there any uh, is there anything you would like to talk about in particular as we start off on this arc? We've talked about twenty six. Where do you want to go next? Twenty nine. Okay. This is the episode where Jeremy ends up taking the fall for the things that Hero Girl did mm. because she can like uh, influence powers people. of suggestion. Yes. Uh, very the uh, power of the voice. I heard a rumor, but. <laughs> Her whole, mind control. Yes, her whole thing is like she'll whisper in your ear. The only person it doesn't work against is Kagaragi because he's always lying to himself. <laughs> and we'll get to that in a little bit. Or other people. But yeah, it's just like with her, she basically made the Bugnarok like attack people and things like that. And base and Jeremy had to take the fall for it, leading to one of the best scenes in this entire show. I'm clapping for a reason. <laughs> The, the applause after Jeremy gives his performance, and he and Garojin like go away and get defeated. Mm-hmm. And here appears, uh, like, oh my god, you're all clapping for me! And <laughs> oh, this whole scene is so amazing! <laughs> it's it's fantastic. It's so yeah. good. Everybody was flipping out on this episode. I, King Gojo was trending every week. It just never stopped. <laughs> <laughs> God, this whole scene was amazing. That first real fight against one of the jesters with Hirobuto is just insane. They also tried, uh, they fought Goma, who was the ninja. Mm. Uh, and that's how we end up getting the scene of the king's retainers coming down and hurting them. And them end up getting put into prison, which leads to the whole thing uh, being Jeremy's idea when it was really Hirobuto mm. uh, doing all of this with Goma. Yep. The fights in this second half were crazy, but we'll get to some of them later. But yeah, episode 29 is a high point mm. for me. It's so good. It's tough, yeah. Having to deal with all the jesters, those first fights against the jesters as they go to the various uh, kingdoms and everything, where they really can't hurt them. Except for Rita. Rita being the most OP in this show. Taking on two of them. On their own. <laughs> Later on. <laughs> uh. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Uh. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Anything else uh, jumping out about the first couple episodes of part two? Uh. No, it's, it's just, it's too good. There, This also ends up being the reason, though, why the... Um, what is what is the name of Jeremy's uh the Bugnarok? Yeah. Um this is also why they're not around for a lot of the good part, because they've been exiled. Yeah. Jeremy does end up coming back, but more or less in secret. He's he's also always like behind the cause like he's still meeting with everyone and talking with everyone, but yeah. he's like, I remember I can't be seen here, I'm evil. Which is sort of an echo Gira at the beginning. Of what Gira was, was doing then. in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Also, uh, I think I, I um, unless you want to jump to this later. If we're gonna, t- are, we, are we gonna talk about the villains at all at the end? Or yeah, we're gonna talk about pretty much everybody at the end of this. Okay, uh, Glody, who is Garen from Blade, mm. uh, ends up being the one who was actually the wrath of the gods. He was the one who caused that. Yeah, this guy, uh, the one who killed uh, Himino's parents. Yes, he killed Himino's parents with God Scorpion's venom. Mm-hmm. Uh, ended up poisoning. The fields and the grain of tofu with Iroki. The amount of like people having to turn against each other. It happens a lot in this show. Yeah. I want to talk about that episode in depth, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, What do you want to talk about first? uh, Karas, who was the science lady in Drive. Mm. She was the. Oh, she's the. the, uh, Kagaragi's. uh, No. Iroki is uh, Kagadai's predecessor. Oh. 
Caras was uh, Rita's. Oh, was that was that one right? Thank you. Yes, and they uh, ended up trapping Grody in an ice cage because the judge of uh, Gokan has th- their trump card is the ability to freeze has has like an ice power that they can use to freeze like like someone who cannot be judged, someone who is too powerful. They can use this power to freeze both themselves and whoever it is that they are judging in ice, like like permafrost. Now, like you can't you can't unthaw it. Tardis had a husband because they basically had to put Glody away and not let anybody know about him. Yep. So Tardis ended up freezing the both of them together, mm-hmm. um, and Tardis's husband ended up taking the fall for it, mm. so that nobody would know. Yep. Tardis's husband. It's sad. Is, you know... Yeah, has, very, has, has been in jail yeah, in Gokhan this whole years. time. And they end up having the whole trial. They end up finding out exactly what happened to Kardas and mm-hmm. Grody and all of that. He ends up getting let out. And then in episode 30, he ends up finding where they are and gets killed immediately by yeah. a Jim. Yeah. And that's how Grody ends up getting freed. And Kardas ends up getting killed by a Jim. Yep. It's... It's well done. It's sad. It's, it's very sad. Shows the stakes. It shows you how powerful uh, Glody is as well. Mm-hmm. He can't die. He is. He is. He is an undead. He's an. He's a living corpse. We end up finding out a little bit later that uh, Doug Dead ended up bringing him from the planet that the Bugnarok were originally from. Mm-hmm. He brought him back to life. Yep. And he's basically just sort of in a state of constant recycling, mm-hmm. where he just can't die whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And he that, doesn't like noise. He brought the cicadas in the first place, the cicada shoe gods, and killed everybody on the previous planet. Killed all the bug rock until they left and went to Shikyu. Mm-hmm. Uh, the humans came later. We'll get to that in a second. Where they came from, but well, <laughs> yes. So this is also at the same time that we end up finding out exactly why the bug rock look like they do. Yeah. Because they ended up eating the Shu God souls of the cicadas, mm-hmm. which basically made them go a little bit insane, but it also ended up changing what they look like. Which is why they look like bugs. Yes, because originally they looked more like humans. Mm. And then all this happened because Kami Jin was sent down to cause strife and war and backstabbing between the two. Because that's what Dog Dead likes. Yep. He wants them to destroy each other to have another clean planet. Mm hmm. Caper for my amusement, fools. That's what he does. It's just so well done. Mm. Then we end up getting like all these scenes with the various gestures. My favorite one, well, second favorite, is um, Rita. Mm. Rita's episode with the Idol show. And Mick Nguyen just having like the best American Japanese voice in this Yes. <laughs> that was amazing. Also, Rita's actress showing so great range in this episode. I would also like to. We didn't. There this happens earlier, but we we can talk about this one first. But just the, their actress is amazing. She's great. I love the range and the singing that that uh, they're able to do. She is a dancer. Yeah. So do to both, and um, it's just funny. It's fun. It's good stuff. It's such a fun episode. Yes. And then it shows how OP Rita is at the end of it mm. because Rita was taken on two of the gestures by themselves and just. Beating the shit out of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Rita is, I believe, is stated in the show, like, Kagaragi is strong, yes. Mm. But Rita is the strongest. <laughs> so, <laughs> the body switching episode. The body switching episode. We need to talk about early. this. It's the best body switching episode ever. This happens early on in the second half. As yeah, part of... As part of... Uh, as part of uh, the plan to cause strife, we're going to switch everyone's bodies... And the pairings that they went with were perfect. You have Gira and Jeremy, Himino and Kagaragi, Rita and Yanma. Mm-hmm. I remember people were thinking that they were going to switch the voices. And the reason they thought that, mm. like, they were just going to voice over each other. I'm so glad they didn't. Jeremy and Gira played each other's parts so unbelievably well. <laughs> they're both so good. That they thought it was just like, oh, they're just voicing each other. Yeah. Nope. It was just them. 
playing each other and voicing them. I mean, they've been working with each other for how many episodes now? Yeah. They've, they've, you know, all of the actors have seen each other on set. They know, you know, what they do for those characters. They can obviously talk to each other for notes and whatnot. But, like, Yanma doing Rita's scream <laughs> might be the funniest moment in this whole show. The way Yanma's actor, like, the way his eyes roll back and the way he ha- he's wearing, like, a face mask because he doesn't have the... Uh, Thing that Rita yeah. that Rita normally wears. I love the part because it was Goma who did the body switching and everything. Yeah, and it was just like oh, because it was Rita and Yama shooting at each other using their shield side arms, and uh, it's like you'll hit each other. And they were like, I don't care right now. That is the best. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I, you, you'll be caught in the crossfire. Good, <laughs> F you. And like he can Goma can switch people's weapons around and yeah. everything. He like. Uh, Substitution jutsu. Jeremy ends up like going to hit him with a lance, and it turns into a fish cake. And then he says, "Bang!" It just hits him really hard, like through a wall with a fish cake. <laughs> so good. Oh, good stuff. God. <laughs> I want to talk about my favorite Moving episode on. of the show. Okay, it was after Glody comes back. Okay, let's and get to it. He brings back the previous ruler of Tofu. Uh, Iroki, who is his real life wife? Really? Yeah, that's cool. Uh, apparently, he's a complete nutter wife guy. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, just like he <laughs> loves his wife. That's good. It's great. It's great. It's funny. But um, yeah, this episode because so just, this was your favorite episode. Yes, between okay. Iroki and Kagodagi and finding out exactly what happened during the Wrath of Gods, yeah. why she lit the grain and everything on fire. Why did you betray your people? Yeah, it's just turns like, out. Uh, Glody had poisoned all the all their stores with God Scorpion's venom, mm-hmm. and she was like, "Oh, I can't have people from the other kingdoms thinking that you know I poisoned th- them." No, it's just like that. There's something wrong with our grain. Something wrong with our grain, but oh, but you know, even then, it's like, why are you sending us poisoned stores? Yeah. What's going on here? So she burns it all and herself. Yeah, it like the acting between these two. Especially when you go like back to the past and mm-hmm. the future, and uh, Iroki wanted uh, Kagodagi to cut her down, and he wouldn't do it. And then he does it this time. Mm-hmm. It's my favorite episode of this show. It's so well directed. The two together are just unbelievable. Mm. The structure of the episode, like seeing his past, we really haven't gotten as much of his past uh, in comparison to some of the others. But I'm happy that we got it in this way with Glody bringing her back mm-hmm. and seeing all of this again and how it happened. It's it's just so good. It's legitimately my favorite episode of the show. It's a show that it keeps finding ways to surprise me, and every time it did, it felt natural. It felt earned. It felt good. Even if what happened wasn't always good. By that I mean like the turn of events themselves. And stuff. It's just... It's, it's, uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, it's a fantastic episode, absolutely. Uh, and then we end up seeing Rackley's come back as one of the new five jesters. As, as, the, as the fifth jester. After Glody ends, after Goma ends up getting killed by uh, the new power-up that they got. Dude. I will say, this episode could have done with a little bit more time in the oven in some cases because there was a lot of, you know, really shaky cam. Some of the CGI didn't look that great. And but it was didn't bother me. The scale of it was the wild part. (laughs) This is the episode where they get their like weapon power-ups, right? Mm -hmm. Where uh Yanma has figured out there is some sort of ancient code in our weapons. If I can hack into that, I can find a way that, like, we can, like, directly harness the power of the Shoe Gods in our weapons. And we can get even more powerful. And they do. And it rules so freaking hard. It's just, oh my gosh. Like, this whole scene, I would... I honestly, I didn't notice any shaky cam. I thought the CGI was fine, but I'm just talking about my experience. I thought this scene... Just ruled so hard. Like, the way it looks. The state. What is at stake? What is happening on screen? The dialogue between the characters. The... 
that final moment of like when Gira says like that final one liner to uh, Hidabiru before they're about to slash her. And just, it's like, we're gonna get now, and just when the weapons charge up and the camera like pulls back, it's like, it was, dude, I was like throwing the horns up, I'm fist bumping the air, like, this is the coolest thing. Well, the Hero no like, power uh, up has ever been this cool. Yeah, because Hero uh, basically turned everybody of Inkasova against, against, against them. Yeah, and. Uh, just like I, uh, you told me if I let them go, you would let me go. And we said like, we'd consider it. Yeah, <laughs> that was like I was like, oh, that's the hardest line that this show. And, that, and that's what, and that's when they do the finisher, and they're just like, "F you, we're gonna kill you." And then she's like, "No, help!" And then but beforehand, Rackley's actually mentioned something to Hidabu with the help of Kagodagi mm. to whisper something to Goma, just in case something happens to Hidabu, they'll switch spaces. Yep. <laughs> And Goma's line of like, oh, I can't believe I'm doing this. Substitution Jutsu. And then he switches. And then he realizes where he's been switched to. And he's like, why? <laughs> and then he dies. And they kill one of the jesters. Yep. And then they all pass out for an episode of Suffragera. That moment. at the Because they do it. The finisher is over. The royal arms disappear. Dude, they walk up in a circle and they just do a group fist bump. And it was the most hype thing in the world. I loved it so much. And I'm like, yes, Bonds, let's do this. And then the next episode, we end up finding out that Gira is Jesus. Sort of. Ma- Immaculate, Immaculate Conception. Conception. Which, uh, what, Caucasus is his name? Uh, Rackley's and his father died. Mm-hmm. Well, no, his mother died. His mother died giving birth to him. Yeah. And this is also the episode, right before, because uh, Doug Dead can control him mm. and the Shoe Gods because yeah. they came from Doug Dead. Um, but Gira was able to break free because he, that Rainbow Jirida that happened at the beginning of the show, was actually... Was, Kuwag- Sh- was Shoe God. Yeah, was Kuwagon Soul. Was Powderized Shoe God. Yep, it was Kuwagon Soul. Mm-hmm. And he ate that and that's why he could control the Shoe Gods. And that's also why, like... Don't take control of Yeah, but also, I, I, they might get into this later. With the whole, like, that's, like, forming part of his personality as well. I think they get into that later. Yeah, because they they sort of do foreshadow this. Rack okay, I do really... want, Okay, I do want to talk about um, this episode, though. The... Because uh, Gira is controlling the god uh, King Oger, yeah. their mech, at the behest of Dagdad. But Gira doesn't want to do it. You know, he's he's like physically being controlled. And then it's the Shoe Gods rebel. The Shoe Gods rebel against Dagdad and they start because it's like the, it's the mech. And then there's like two big Bugnarok uh, monsters behind him. Which allows and Kuag And Kuagata Oder just like turns around and just destroys them. And uh, uh, King Oder. King Oder, thank you. Because it's a like King Oder is the mech, but it's also the Sentai. It's yeah. still a little confusing, but whatever. Um, but yeah, King Oja turns around, destroys them, and this they all realize, yeah, and they also realize it's like, oh, they, they do have souls, they have minds of their own, and they don't want to f- fight for Dugdid at all. They know where Gira's heart is, and they're going to fight for him, and it's a great scene. This is also sort of explains why Dugdid didn't do it again, because more than likely he can't control Gira anymore, mm-hmm. since the shoe gods broke free. Yep. Um, but yeah, this whole scene, and then... Next episode, we get another fight between Gira and Rackles. Rackles, the uh, what was it? The Abominable is his name now. Mm. And it all turns out to be that Rackles was playing six chess this entire time, being the best character in this show, being a reluctant tyrant because he did not want to do it. But from the time that he was a kid, when his dad was killed mm. by uh, Glody and Kamijin. Yep. He basically had to be subservient to uh, Dig Dog. I have to keep up the guise of being subservient to Dog Dead while at the same time manipulating the other kings and manipulating the citizens of, of Chiku and of my kingdom and making sure that everyone's power falls into the right place so that when the time comes, we can rise up against Dog Dead. And then I have to give my brother King Kuagata soul and then get him out of here because he was turning into, a little bit into a Bugnarog. Yeah. Uh, some point, 
<clears throat> got him out of there. His memories end up getting wiped. But Garrett ends up being his the wild card in mm-hmm. this because he could not um, control him, predict he him, no anything that Garrett would do because he was outside of. His, and he just had to uh, play. And like whatever Garrett did, he had to play along. He had to play around it. Yeah, and play along rewriting his plans. I say what you mean by sixty chess, yeah. but because even Kagaragi had no idea. Here's why this is one of the best twists in Toku history. The way, first off, the way it's revealed is uh, like, is, the trial. Is, the, is just 10 out of 10. When it's like, do, Dag Dad is like, okay, do this for me. If you get him, if you get him to like where you can finish him up, I will like unlock something in your weapon and yeah, power it up. Because you can't kill him. You're mm. sort of. He's immortal. Yeah, he's immortal because of Dag Dad. Yep. And the reason, and because like the way that happened with. Uh, the king, the king and queen, Gira's, Gira and Reckless' parents, they kneel before Dag did, and and his father asks him for power, which he, in his mind, is like, okay, one day I will use this power to destroy you. And it's like, okay, sounds good. Here you go. And it's a fetus. Just, it's Gira in your mother's womb. Like, the, apparently it was like a very rapid pregnancy, and she gave birth soon after and died immediately after a result. And... Yeah, this whole thing of... Well, one, Rack is sort of being there the entire time. Mm-hmm. And Jeremy has been the narrator. Yeah. But you also find out that he was more or less told a false history. So he just ended up writing that down because that has just been there mm-hmm. and putting all these machinations with comedy. He's telling the story that he knows. Yeah, he's telling the story that he knows. He didn't know like anything with Dagda because Dagda was out of scope. And again, uh, to, to get back to what I said about this being the greatest twist, the way that they recontextualize everything because they go back and show you because this is like a clip, clip show, show. It's a clip episode show. <laughs> where they go back and show you you know all, from all the events from the previous you know several you know however long episodes and they have reckless narrating over top of it and they completely recontextualize everything in a way that feels like okay yeah the, that makes sense you showing me this him telling us why he did it this makes sense. Him getting thrown off. And I off understand why. Of the... Uh, of the cliff. Of the cliff and taking that potion that Suzume gave him. Yep. To basically make it... He basically... Romeo it's a sleeping himself. death. Wait, was it Romeo or Juliet? Juliet. Juliet was the one who took the potion first, right? To like put her in sleep death. Juliet was the one who took the potion to go to sleep. Romeo took the poison which killed him. Yeah. So he basically Julieted himself. Letting... And she wanted to go along with him. Juliet, Sleeping Beauty, that kind of yeah. thing. But he was like, no, you have to stay here because you're a brother. Mm-hmm. So, Rathus is out here legitimately playing everyone. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of this, when he is about to strike Gira down, Doug Dick comes down and I gives wo- him the power to kill immortals. Yes, I wondered if we were going to see a face turn. And when that camera cuts, it's like the sound drops it out. of the, ca- the camera cuts to his eyes and his eyes shift back towards Dag Dad. I'm like... Yo, here we go! Let's do this! Oh my gosh! It's so good. The way it happens is so good. And at the end, when all is when all when like all the dust has settled on this particular series of events, when it's Gira and Rackley's fighting together for the first time. When that happens, that happens and it's amazing, but more than that, when they embrace each other. At the end, it's when, his when, brother. when it's 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 like truly brothers embracing each other because it shows you they like come towards each other and then it cuts to their ch- to their kid actors and the kid actors hug each other and then it cuts to them as adults and they're like hands clasped with each other and then we see like the kids like hugging in the foreground and it's like oh this is amazing. A lot of emotional impact. Also, the kid that they got to play young Rackley's looks so much like him. Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's like, He's oh, a that's good just actor you. Too. Good actor, too, yeah. <laughs> that's just you. Mm-hmm. And then we end up going to the trial, end up finding out, like, through the clip shows, like, you're... <laughs> Rita wants to put him to death. <laughs> because it's just like, you cause a lot of people to they, die. They invoke the death sentence, yeah, yes. Yeah, it's like, you cause a lot of people to die mm-hmm. during this time. Yep. Like, we understand the reasoning behind it, because what... But <laughs> but we got a lot to unpack here. <laughs> but at the same time, bro, you cause a lot of people's death. Mm-hmm. And but Yanma and the others are like, what if we use him mm-hmm. with King Ocha Zero? Because especially because they need King Ocha Zero. Yeah. Uh, well, King Ocha Caliber Zero uh, to give the rest of the weapons a copy of that immortal killing yep. power 
because they do kill uh, Doug, Doug did the first time, but McNoan is still around. And apparently, like, inside of him is a clone mm-hmm. of uh, Dagda. He had planned for this. Yeah. And contingencies. Because when Dagda died the first time, his, like, ghost or something was laughing. <laughs> yep. Or, like, at least neither from another reality. Something along those lines. We gotta go back. I think it's another him that he created. We gotta go back. Okay. So, to what? not too long after Dead Dead comes out, and it's like after the first here bit of fight, mm-hmm. Dead Dead teleports them across the universe. And. This happens kind of early on in. The second half. In the, the second show. half. But this is a crossover. The. The, the justification of like, I'm bored, I don't want you in here. Through a portal, you all go, and they wind up on our Earth. Earth. And it's a cure user crossover because anniversary? Yeah. Um This we, is we will end up getting a King Ozer versus This is uh, like the only thing about this show I didn't like. I like the Cure Uger crossover. I like how they integrated it into the actual story. This is where the people originally came from. The people on GQ, this is where they originally came from. They built King Kong because it's Kabuto, left and went off into space yeah. before uh, the bad guys from the Kira Rouges got there, of course. Um, the problem is this a person. Problem is multiple. <laughs> I'm going to say, because I didn't mind most of it. I thought this was a fun one. is because like they end up tying the histories together of the two shows. That's great. It's a little bit of world bending. building. The problem is Prince. Well, that too. We're on a di- yeah, so Daigo's not in this. Neither Daigo or Uchi are in this. Not, they're, in, they're in the verses with King Ojer. Mm. That'll be coming out later this year. But neither of them are in this. So we end up having Daigo's son from the future. Son from the future. Dude, that first line delivery that we get from He's him. He's a terrible actor. It's when... He's a stun actor. He shows up. He fights a monster. He like leaps across like a city, like untransformed, and like slashes a monster, kills it. Whatever. Okay, part of the course for Kyo Yuja for Red Ranger to do something like that. But that happens, and then he lands, and he's like, "That was brave." It's like that. It's like that's the delivery. The other, I'm not exaggerating. It's just like, yeah. That was great. He's being, I'm an actor in the Kyoryujers. He's Let's being, go fight stuff. He's being taught by Soji, and his actor himself is like a stunt actor. He does a lot a lot of flips and stuff like that. He's very very athletic, so it's fun to like see him fight. But man, is he a terrible actor. I mean, awful. And he's coming back in the verses, and I'm so upset about it. Unfortunately, yeah, and it really drags this whole thing down. However, it also does end up uh, pulling out, like, G- uh, Gear is the only one who could transform it this time. Yeah. Because they're all away from the Shoe Gods. Yep. Uh, and that's, I mean, this is before we end up finding out that he has Kuigan Soul in it, but that was a big rumor going around at the, yep. at the time. Um, and then they end up getting some copy of that, and they give it to Prince so he can also transform, and then and they get the music of the people back. It's great to see everybody else. I don't... <sighs> I don't really like Kyoryuger, so like it didn't do anything for me. But just, like, I always like so like yeah, it's like oh there's Ian. I'm like okay yeah that's him. And there's I, Ami. She does nothing but get kidnapped. There's the Green Ranger. He's the Green I like Ranger. Seeing them. It's just like it's fun. I, I like seeing characters return and things like that. The biggest issue is the fact that I Prince do. Exists. If I like the characters, the biggest issue is the fact that Prince exists. And he's I'll, there. I'll admit, like the, the best part of the whole crossover, I think, is the end when it's revealed that, that he gone is for six months. No, that it's that he that that's not till the next episode. I'm talking about when it's revealed that he is the son of Daigo and Ami, because the other Rangers don't know this, and they're like, "Wait, did you say your last name was Owa?" Oh, huh? And then I think it's black and blue, like look over at Ami and they're like, "Oh," and she just kind of goes, "Well, what can I say?" I guess. <laughs> Time and then the two of them go, oh my. Another of the bad guys is back. The music of the world has been... They took the bad guys from Cure Uger and merged them into one being. Yeah. Which, okay. Sure. It's, it's fine. Why not? It's, it's just... I mean, Candelaria and Lucky Arrow are still around. Well, well, they have to be because of the 100 years after thing. But... But yeah, they're, they're still around. They're doing their thing. And... Um, the best thing about this... She's... Candelira is engaged to the Blue Ranger now? Sure. Um, she does yeah. have a human form, so I guess. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not... I mean, I'm not... 
I'm not angry about that. I was, I'm, I was just bringing, I'm just bringing it up as a, as a talking point. Like, yeah. okay, sure, that's fine. Yeah, it's a thing that's happening. It's a thing that's um, happened. It's fine. I do like... Because I do like how they implement music in this one. Yeah. There are some music... Because, like, Curator, no, I'm not a big fan, but there are some things I like about it. Um, implementing the... Um, da, na, 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 they do implement that into the score, which I think is pretty good. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's not awful but it's like it's, yeah. it's it's there to explain how the humans got to cheap you that's yeah. really what this portion is for and i like that i like mm-hmm. the fact that they connected it like that because that's not something you really expect to happen but you're I'm, just like oh we're here oh we got to get back or we get, we're back at six months later yeah, that's like just, no we came here and there's a reason for why we're here even though doug did tell who is here yeah we're in japan now where's the cgi background <laughs> it was a little bit of a shock because like that whole sequel, like that whole like couple of episodes is all filmed without is like not on the volume. After we've been doing it for everything else thus far and since, with a few exceptions here and there where we're fighting in like the quarry for the duels and whatnot. But yeah, and then we go back and then we find out there was some time dilation. Um, King Kong and Kabuto came to get them, which was the original ship that they built to get to Chiku in the first place, mm-hmm. and. Uh, yeah, like, Dig Dug is, like, Ragley's is taken back over, mm-hmm. um, Dig Dug is like a hero. That's what the fifth jester is revealed, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's not revealed to be Rackless later, but you can kind of figure it out. Yeah, I mean, th- he's, he goes full char, and with the mask. Yeah. I would say the mask, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty char. <laughs> full char, full, full frontal, um, if you watch Unicorn, which you should, because Unicorn is great, gonna be Unicorn. Um... But yeah, like we end up getting all of this, all of the rack, Rackley's backstabbing. Um, the ending of this the show, turn. there is a little bit, like it feels like uh, some things are happening a little bit too quickly, like the other Jester is dying. Um, well, at least Hirobuda dies. Goma's already dead. He's been dead for a couple episodes. Hirobuda dies. Sort I, of, I think it's handled well. I think it's just a little bit too fast because Hirobuda's like, she's done so much. She's done so much, but here we go. She like We're, we're wrapping up. I, I do love... The way they take out the big guy, because uh, it's discovered that the kings have within themselves... The king... Uh, uh, like, different different sets of superpowers. King Cress. King Cress. And, um... Because, like, Rita has their ice powers, yeah. is an example of that. And, they actually and everyone is unlocking the their, rest. And everyone is unlocking their other ones, which all stand in contrast to what it is that their kingdom is about. Yeah. Yanma has the ability to control electricity, which can destroy technology. Um, Himeno has the power to basically just reap life yeah. in her kingdom, which is all about beauty and prosperity. Rita has the eyes. Kagadagi has, has fire. fire which Iroki probably used. To, yeah. I never thought about that, but you're absolutely right. Huh. But the way they seal that guy in ice when... Mino. Mino. Mi- yeah. Mino, thank you. When, um, when they do that and Rita is using their ice... And Ka- the way they have Kagaragi stand behind her, the- behind them, I'm so sorry, I am so sorry. The way they have him stand behind them, emanating fire to keep them warm and to... Make sure they don't freeze themselves. Yes, and exactly. We don't want another car situation. Yes, exactly. Th- they had to take out Mignonen to stop Rackley's from possibly coming back. Mm-hmm. This is also a great episode for the sisters because everybody like sort of gets de-aged. And we end up finding out yeah. more about uh, Suzume and Morphonia throughout mm. this episode. And how worried Morphonia is to take over Rita's place mm. when that eventually ends up coming to be. Yeah. There have been the, there were two de-aging episodes. One where... I think it's turned back into kids. Yeah, everyone gets turned into kids. That doesn't happen for very long, but it's still kind of a fun little bit. And <laughs> because Kagaragi is 10 years old and huge. Yeah. He's, he's just him. He's, he's like, hmm, I seem to have aged 10 years judging by my muscles and hair length. <laughs> And that that's pretty funny. No, he's just like, this is me at 10 years old. A full-grown man. I don't think he was... No, he, no, that's he, what he, he says I de-aged 10 years. No, he said I de-aged to 10 years old. Because everybody was like... He says. Yeah, he was 10 and everybody else was like very young. But in, in Tofu, they built their... <laughs> they're just like, okay. 
<laughs> but it is funny that they're all like regular like kids are running around and he's just like a grown ass adult like hey everybody hey hey come on gather around and it's like it's like a camp counselor like, well, trying to herd cats <laughs> this is the thing that's happening i guess mm. um but yeah and, and then this episode is like their minds end up getting damaged, yeah. which also ends up doing some things for reckless because this is something that he did not get to do initially he didn't get to take care of his brother they do age them because um what is it Gira is essentially been turned into a kid. Yeah. And, uh, what is it? Yanma and Himeno are like babies. Yeah. And Jeremy is getting Simon to take care of them throughout this entire That's episode. amazing. Comedy. Um, but Rita and Kagaragi don't get hit. So yes. they basically. Which is why they're off uh, doing their own thing. But, uh,. Suzume and Morphonia do. Mm-hmm. So they basically end up having to do all that. We end up finding out that Suzume was originally just going to end up killing Rackless before she actually fell in love with the guy. Mm-hmm. Um, Which, we can get to this when we talk about characters. Keep going. Yeah. This is just such a good episode. They have to take on McNoan because if they don't, and they end up finding a way to kill uh, Doug, Dig Day, mm-hmm. um, you know, he'll just end up coming back again. So they have to basically sideline McNoan. Because it's really difficult to kill him. He just has a whole bunch of water bugs, which are the things in Dig Dug's head, mm. inside of him. So it's just like, it's almost nine years impossible to kill him. They find that out through Rita being a badass and cutting him open in an earlier episode. Rita rules. Rita is so good. Rita rules. They are my favorite. <laughs> but yeah. Next. Um, um, I want to talk about Brody. the... Hmm? Grody's next. Oh, boy. Where the reason Jeremy has an age is because his king's proof is inside of him. Mm-hmm. It's just a crystal. Which is keeping him immortal. Yeah, because uh, Himino, like cuts him with her king crest. And it's like, you would think that would just kill Grody. It doesn't work. No, nope. Because dude's immortal. So they had to shoot him with it's, Jeremy. It's, it's, it's less that he's immortal, more that he's undead. Yeah. Because her... Her power works on life. Reaps life away, and like it, it, it's decay. Yeah, because you and you can't and you cannot reap life from that which does not have any. So we have to make Glody alive. alive. We have to like give him life. Then this will work on him, and then we can like kill him for real. That's what they and that's what they do. Uh, I love. I just love like the pairings that we get. I love Rita with Kagaragi, and I love Himino with Jeremy. It's just such a good pairing. And Yanma with Yanma Gira. with Gira. Um, it does the, lead into one of my favorite things about this entire show, though. It's when Glody ends up being killed. <laughs> Dude. It's not enough. It's not enough that we have to kill you. No, 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 no. No, 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 said the writer. We will not do that. Your suffering has but begun. It's not enough that we have to kill the villain... We have to show you the beginning of them starting to suffer in the afterlife. Glody wants silence more than anything else because it's something that he can't get. Mm, so That's one of the reasons he's so kill happy. Yeah, when uh, Dick Dug brought him back, that was like the thing. He just can't have be silent anymore. Mm. Like have silence. Mm-hmm. So when he gets sent to Hakamaka, all these spirits just start to come around him. And spirits of like those he's killed more than like just start tormenting him. And he just starts losing his mind, just and running the, around. Ah, shut up! Especially all the people like Bugnarok that he brought back, because mm. he's been bringing up corpses of like past monsters of the week and yep. the foot soldiers and everything. Yeah, and them basically being undead. And it's it was also undead, a, but also mindless. He doesn't really control them. He just brings them back. Yeah, there's one part earlier where um, Jeremy's just like, we have to have some respect for the people of the dead, and you know because the Bugnarok sort of don't. Yeah. And they end up burying, burying them. The bodies are just like it's a nice little scene with respects. him, with him and Garajim. Oh. Nice scene. And the rest of them because they're not bad guys. The Bugnarok are not bad guys anymore after Desnarok dies. Or actually, like right before Desnarok dies, as soon as that happens, they stop being bad guys. Yeah, and they end up becoming a part of the world. And the only reason they were is because they were following Desnarok. Yeah. And now, and then once that happens, and they're following Jeremy now. You know, things things change. Also, the first episode... Bug Rock is its own kingdom. ...that Glody ends up coming, you know, back from being frozen. Um, Jeremy's mom comes back. Mm. And we see how much of a badass she is. That gets explored later. Mm-hmm. She's very Ara Ara. She's very Ara Ara woman. Got those vibes, yeah. Yeah, very Ara Ara woman. <laughs> I'm just like, okay. 
All right. <laughs> she, she is very much oh, Jeremy, my sweet boy. Mama loves you so much. It's that Come to of, my boobs. That, that does happen. That does happen. That does happen. That does happen. Uh, but yeah, Glodians are getting killed. Minoians are getting sidelined. Then we get to the end game. Literally. Before, yeah, yeah. before that, I need to talk about the episode where they kill Hirabiru. At the end of that, after the after the whole mech fight, mm. and they're on the ground, there is just like a group hug that happens at the end of that episode. It's also been a very long time since he has seen the mech. You don't get to see the mech that out in after 26. It shows up, but there are gaps. so rarely. It's like months of gaps. <laughs> I mean, because I, I mean, I watched it, you know, in like big five episode chunks. So like, you know, over the course of several days. So for me, it was like, oh yeah, there it is. But yeah, if you were watching this as it was airing, it would be like, it was there goes months. a whole month and there was no mech fight. <laughs> See, there were two months with no mech fight. Jeez. It was great. But it made it seem so Gosh, good. it's almost like you're starting to realize, wait, what if we have great characters and can rely on them it's not to even tell that. our stories? It's not even that. It's and not like, rely on past tropes. The mech... Like, when it shows up, it feels like so much more of an event. Mm. So it just gives it a lot more weight to when things are happening. It's great. I love the fact that we didn't get the mech like fights for so long. It's also there a lot, and it's so story central in the first half. Mm-hmm. So I think it's... Um, also, I speaking of mechs, I do need to talk about this real quick. When the castle transforms for the first time... Oh, the music. The music that plays during that... It's so good. It's like one of the best pieces of music ever written for Sentai. No mech transformation. Love the cockpit of King Kong's Kabuto because it's just a throw It's so cool. I like the cockpits in general where it actually, for the first time, feels like it's very Pacific Rim. What those things are called. They're like actual motion things that they use mm-hmm. to control the mechs. And I just think that's really cool. Yeah, but the, the way it actually goes like full Pacific Rim and we actually have like an apparatus that our heroes are controlling. It looks so cool. Yeah. And that transformation when the castle transforms. Like no mech transformation in all of Super Sentai. None of them have ever looked this cool, felt this epic, or felt this earned. And it was amazing. Yeah. It's just really good. Mm. It's really, really good. But then we get, we're going to jump to our last three episodes. Yes. Which will, thanks to Decca Green, be getting a director's cut. Which, that's fascinating. That, like, an actor from another Sentai was like, hey, I want to see more of this. Uh, Actually, this show had a lot of Sentai actors watching it week after week. (laughs) A lot of Sentai and writer actors just continuously watching it. Nice, nice. Then people were getting so excited. Mm. This show is huge. I'm not even just talking about for Sentai. I'm talking about like for media. Yeah. It's really big. It reached so far outside of its like normal. Like Dombros did. Mm. But in a different way. It just reached so far outside of its normal audience. That a lot of people were watching the show every single week. Mm. I want to ask. When those director's cuts come out. Do you think you want to review those? Maybe. It depends on how much has changed. Because it's going to end up being just one long episode of the last three yeah. with extra scenes and stuff. Uh, I mean, it's perfect. I mean, starting off with episode 48, where it opens up and... Shoot it just- And it's... You tweeted me after episode 48 that you felt like you just watched Endgame. Yeah. And the opening of this, where Doug Dead is like sitting... He's like posed exactly like Thanos when it's like, well, what will you do, father? Wait. He's posed exactly like Thanos. The thing? And it's just a blasted hellscape. And like you said, widescreen. Yeah. They changed the aspect ratio for this opening scene. And it was like, oh. It made yeah, it we're in the so end game. And this, and this is serious. It made, it made it so much more cinematic yeah it feels more cinematic when you have that like all that extra space that you're that you're showing yeah and doug that at this point is just like you know what you know what i'm gonna do it it's it's thanos it's fine i'll do it myself yeah but the this episode 48 is more or less because we open we kind of we kind of open at the close with like the flash forward of what's going to happen but rita 
and everyone else, they enact uh, Protocol Zero. Yeah, because they were, they were getting everything ready inside of uh, King Kong's Kamato, inside of the castle. Mm-hmm. And Doug Dead appears sitting on the throne. Yep. It's like, what if I was here now? And <laughs> basically just proceeds to wreck shop. He casts Meteor. Sephiroth would be proud. Because he actually got to do it. So... <laughs> It's so well done. Uh, this whole part was the wildest thing I think I've ever seen in regards to Otoku. It felt like it, it felt like what Bill wanted to do. It's like an I mean, yeah, it's an overused word, sure, but epic. That's what it feels like yeah. when when the meteors are raining from the sky again. It's like Thanos when he throws the moon and just destruction rains down upon Shugodam. I mean, especially because they're just coming out. We didn't mention this, but during like Glody was over two episodes, which is good because he didn't appear in that yeah. many. But they in the episode the, prior, they stopped the wrath of God. That's yeah. we have, we have with that great group of which scene. was really something more for Himino than anybody else since she lost her parents during that. And this time they saved everybody. Yep. By getting everybody underground. Yeah. And, uh. And then in this episode, when Protocol Zero is enacted, um, the attendants all have a backpack. They, like, every citizen, you know, from all six uh, countries, they're all, like, in this secluded part of the forest, waiting. Um, the... What is it? The the castle, like the the big one that's gonna like transport them, shows up, mm-hmm. and they open the bags earlier than they should, and a message plays saying, "We're gonna stall for time because we yeah. don't we don't have the, like all the things that we need in order to stop him. You go into space, like get a, get as far away from here as you can, however long it takes, then come back here once you've finished everything and destroy him." And they choose not. To follow this order. And Kame Jim shows up. Kame Jim shows up disguised as Broom Man. I'm yeah. sure he has a name. I just call him Broom Man. It's accurate. He's the one who's just been loud the entire show. Yeah. Um, and, you know. The way they find out it's an imposter is pretty funny. It's like, oh, he's yelling. He's the real one. <laughs> and then, you know, the, the ship takes off. Yeah. And it gets shot down. It's, yeah. And Gira is... At his breaking point, he yeah. thinks all the citizens of Chiki were dead, and they go back yeah. to Reckless and Kamajum fighting each other, mm-hmm. and a portal on your left, Death. on your left, Death, Death Rock. Narok freaking comes out of a portal and is like. You, Kame Jim, we would have words with thee. <laughs> and holy shit, we are off to the races. That scene now, of everyone. Devonica has been gone for pretty much most of the show. Yeah. Uh, but she basically just went back to the orphanage because, you know, long bloodline and everything. Serving, uh, the reason that the whole movie happened is, is because the uh, ruler of Sugardon has to go see Raynal. Yeah. And Reynolds going to take over and come back and yep. do things better. Um, Devonica ends up coming back in episode 49 and brings back the people who were... She brings back Karas. She brings back Himeno's parents. She brings back Iroki. She brings back... Uh, Baraba. No, yeah. not Baraba. That's not the name. Uh, that's the chick from... Uh, I think she's technically responsible for bringing uh, Death Rock back as well. She is. If she's if she's the one who opened the portal. What was his name? But also the Bo first... Shemar. But Berdaba was the chick from Geet. Yeah, uh, but also like the first king, he's back. But uh, yeah, Bolshemar, the he other... He comes in at the end, though. But... But it rules. The, the, what happens before that, Iroki, like everybody else, all the kings are... Because like, really they're injured. all indisposed. They've been, you know, seriously injured. And Iroki and Kars come out and be like, or just like, uh, especially Iroki, is just like, you could, you know, you could be out here standing up, but I guess I'll do something in this case. And we'll take out our pain of being dead on these people, the pain and anger of being dead on uh, these basically resurrected bodies. On the that, armies of Doug Dead. Yeah. That he's basically just brought back a whole bunch of resurrected bodies. Just the stuff in... We get our first female Black Ranger. Yeah. In Iroki. Yeah, we do. It's so cool. The things that really pull my emotional strings. Scenes of people coming together. 
scenes of people Same. banding together to Same. fight uh, injustice and whatnot. The the end of the movie, a taxi a uh, taxi driver, South Korean film, just has destroyed me like nothing else. The end of Godzilla minus one, when all the ships come at the end, was incredible. Seeing everyone, like everyone, rally behind their kings. You know, regardless of who they are, like the people who can't fight, like stay back and help treat the wounded. And it's just like, yeah, I teared up. I teared up multiple times throughout this this whole thing. My favorite part about this is the maid. What is her name? The maid from Ishibana. Are you talking uh, about the are you talking about the one with the like the orange like yeah. circle hair? Yeah. Cleo and Kuroda, who is uh the uh person from Tofu. The attendant. Oh, I love him. The two of them whoop ass. <laughs> they beat the shit out of everybody who comes up to them. They are out here taking on the jester's bodies mm-hmm. uh, that uh, Dick Doug has brought back. Mm-hmm. And just beating the shit out of them. And they were just like, I hope after this we could spar. And I'm just like, please. <laughs> please do. Because the Don Brothers got your king skill. <laughs> that's what happens in the trailer the Darn Brothers got them killed that's where they're in Hakabaka <laughs> and I'm sitting here like you know what that tracks oh dear <laughs> that that tracks for them oh dear tracks I'm... for the Darn Brothers oh no don't let them die they'll come back because the so. cure usually one happens afterwards it's just really funny and I'm just like that tracks <laughs> but anyway back to this yeah the entire scene where it just really felt like end game and we had the kings over here and like eating and things to like get the strength back up mm-hmm. and Sebastian doing a dance to make them feel better. Yep. Cute little character moments. And then Raynal comes out of the portal. Yep. And just wipes out all of the Dig Duck's people. Wipes out every single member of the opposing force leaving only Dog Dead for our heroes to face off because he disappears like soon afterwards. But... For that, we need to talk about Death in the Rock and Kamijimu. It's not enough that I have to kill you. Oh, that happens last episode. I know, but it's not enough that I have to kill you. No, 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 that will not do. I am going to grab you, drag you into hell myself, and then... You we have to we have to show the beginning of his suffering for his you treachery. You get to live forever and die continuously. They basically gold experience requiemed his ass because you're gonna die forever. Mm-hmm. He dragged him back with the uh, tarantula. The other tarantula is like it was a friend of. Uh, Death Rock is like, no, you can't come. I back. love that. <laughs> it's not your time yet, little one. You stay here. And the tarantula looks sad. The way it's a little like toy, but it's like, eh, it's all sad. It wants to go with Death Rock. He was shown earlier with Death Rock. Yes. The end of this show. The end of this show. Where they like uh, Rhino and mentioned something about the eternal chain of the people, mm-hmm. and they can't. They're basically powering up God King Oger. They're trying to make it as powerful enough to stop someone who can control time, space, and can be everywhere at once. How do you kill a god? We make our own. They have to use the will of the people. They use everybody's power. Everyone's like life force, their chi, what have you. The only problem was they didn't have Jeremy's anymore. Mm -hmm. So they basically have to create a new one. Yeah. Out of the will of the people, their life force. Yes. And power up God King Oju that way to have a full Ting and Tapa Gurren Lagan fight. The end of this, the final battle of this, is straight up Gurren Lagan. And I am here for it. It is because D- uh, Dagdead. I almost called call him Dagdead. I was about to call him Dagdead, you <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> God damn it, I've been listening to you for too much. <laughs> so they're about to fight Dig Dug. They're about to fight Dagdead. And. Dig Dug. Shut up! <laughs> About to fight him. And he essentially grows to like the size of the universe. Grows to Doug Dead grows to the size of the universe. And just in the nick of time. Cause it his grows. hand is coming down. Like it's um oh, what was that? What was that game? Osra's Wrath. Yes. Kind of like that. And Gaki Yoder grows into what is its name? Because it's about seven names in one. Jesus Christ. Perfect ultimate. Uh, hold on. 
It's a very long name. It's a very yeah, long love- name that uh, Jan Magas just kind of comes up with on the spot. Transcendent Storming Ultimate Perfect King Oger. Which is the greatest name. Yeah, just like, <laughs> this is unnecessary long to here for But you. it's perfect. But yeah, he, like, D- uh, Dick Does Head is coming down and Perfect Ultimate Transcendent. Uh, perfect Storming Ultimate... Nope. Transcendent, Transcending Storming Ultimate, Ultimate Perfect, perfect King, King Oger. Slaps his hands out and just grows to the size of Dick Dug. Yeah. And they have a fight inside the universe. Yeah. And they just, that's what they do. And then the Shoe Gods basically burn themselves Mm -hmm. and punch him through the source wall. (laughs) That is exactly what happens. They go back to Chikyu and they smash his head to actively kill him this time. They break open the translucent piece piece that's covering it. And the little thing that's in there, they destroy that. It explodes. And his body falls over. And it falls over. And our heroes are victorious. And we get this great shot of them walking away. And they eat. I I like how unvocal some of their celebrations can be. This is just, we're tired. We did it. We're slowly walking away. Jeremy and Gira kind of do like a side fist bump. So do Rita and Kagaragi. And Himeno and Yanma, they high five each other. And we cut back to the people all waiting anxiously. And our heroes show up. And just eruption of applause and cheers, and everyone's happy. Um, the Bugnarok are like hoisting uh, Jeremy into the air, and it's great. All of the people who had, you know, from Hagabaka have already gone back. Uh, that happened at the end of the last episode. Bolshimar yeah. ends up saying, the scene where Bolshimar, Rackles, and Doga are together echoes the scene that happened when Kamen Jin was uh, impersonating him earlier with the, you know, the two swords and the king. And I love that scene. It gave Rackles a closure. I love that scene so much. Just seeing, like, the real one and seeing him reunited with Doga again and reunited with Rackles again because we see, because they show you how he died. Yeah. He was killed by Kamen Jin and it was... This moment of like, now I am one of the king's blades. You stand before me, you fiend. And you yeah, know, he was like protecting Gira. Or he was something. protecting Gira because Gira was still a kid when this and happened. He was like, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be here. Who are you? Like, takes his sword, and then it's Kaiba Jim and he kills him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Kaiba Jim has probably the highest body count for the entire show besides Glody. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I guess Rakos. I feel like Dagdan has the highest count. Yeah. How like, many of this is like all of this? For 2,000 years on Chikyu, this has been going on. And who knows how much blood has been spilled on countless other worlds throughout the universe at his behest. I think he holds the record. Yeah. But yeah, the, the end of the show, now they're trying to come up with a new name for the United People of Chikyu. Yep. And it's just like... They Rita's decide. like... They say something like, we're going to take a, the first part of every country. And it's like... How can you, it's just like nonsense gibberish and they can't even remember how to say it. So they end up fighting over who should come first. And yeah. Like, okay. That'll be fun later. But, but then uh, at the end of the show, um, we have we have some more... We get some like final narration from Jeremy um, imploring us, the audience, to write our own fan fiction. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, kind much. of. It's like, I want you to write the sequel. Like, whatever happens next... You know, that's up to you. And then we get the preview for Don Bros versus King Oger and Kyoruja versus King Oger. Mm. Which is going to be like evil. And we get Kyo- our passing of the torch to Boon Boonger. With where, the car. With the car where it's uh, Gira and Boon Red jumps out and he's like, hey, come on. And they get in the car and they drive off into the sunset and it's wonderful. Um, characters. But that's the story of Osama Sentai King Oger. The characters. Start with Gira. Start with the red. Um, this show in general, with, I mean, even even coming off of Don Brothers, yeah. which I adore, absolutely adore. King Oger has raised the bar for Toku storytelling characterization action sets like the onus is now on everything that comes after this to try and reach this level if or surpass it this show is sort of the epitome of all killer no filler because there's no filler episodes in this show 
And you know, I mean, I, I'm sure some of you may, I'm sure some of you may be wondering. Oh, it's like, well, which was better, Don Brothers or this? It's like, th- here's the thing: you let, can't compare them. Let, 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 let me get to my point. So it's two; they're two very different kinds of shows. Don Brothers is very is much more smaller scale, much more character focused. I mean, not not that this one isn't, but it's like if somebody, t- it's like it's like, well, which do you prefer, The Godfather or Gladiator? Both are great movies. They just offer very different experiences. Yeah, it's like with Don Brothers, it's such a different show in comparison to this mm-hmm. because King Oja is just it is the epic. It's so much bigger than itself. Yeah, with Don Brothers, it's so pared down. So you're just following these characters mm. and how they interact and what they mean to each other. With King Yodra, it's just like, what actions can be taken to stop the gigantic problem? Mm-hmm. And how do we solve that? This show is so amazing because it is its own thing. It's sort of like... I know this is the wrong one. The right one's over there. It's sort of like what Zen Kaiser is to this, mm-hmm. to this. It's so different from each other, mm-hmm. but they're all peak in different ways. Yeah, that's much more subjective, but it's just you, like the stories they want to tell are just so different you, from each other. You look at the past several years of Sentai. Of you, peak. You, of peak, I would agree. You look at how Kira Major was, we're going to, what if we take it as be, like the most stripped down version of what Sentai can be, but elevate it to a quality that it has never been to before yeah. at that level. And then you have you follow that up with Zinkaiger. How do we pay tribute to what has come before? And comedy. And and comedy, but like you know, paying tribute to what has come before, but also paving our way with our own story. We have our own characters that are fleshed out that do stand on their own. And then we get into Dawn Brothers and Dawn Brothers, the way it deconstructs things like like the deconstruction of the overpowered Red Ranger. That we get in this, and the way how they're all terrible, people. and how they and how they are terrible people, and how everyone's and like how does like someone's life really change when you are conscripted into a battle of good versus evil, and people who might be on the side of evil at first, how did how does your relationship with them change when the nuances in these characters start to come forth, and then you have King Oger, which is it. It truly, like, the, we had made the comparison to Game of Thrones prior, like, when we were doing our rumor cast. This is, we take Toku, like, just Toku the genre. I'm not talking about just Sentai here. We take Toku, we take the technology advancements that have been made in television filmmaking, we take what we have learned from writing characters over the past several years, we mix them together how do we create this sprawling epic we keep the intimate character moments we keep but we also make sure we have a big scale and how do we take toku and we elevate it to prestige television and that's what king oger is king oger is the closest thing to prestige television that Toku has ever come. And sure. it's incredible. It's very good. So starting off with Gira. Yeah. The way they use the Red Ranger, the, the hyperactive Red Ranger character. Sort of and the way they contextualize that. I'm the evil king. I will take over the world. The way they like later going into the show. Like as the show is going on. I'm like. You think he's ever going to stop doing that? Because it is getting a little annoying. But no, they have written it in such a way. It's not something he can turn off because it's literally coded in his DNA as a person. Mm -hmm. Because of how he was created. And that's brilliant, I think. I think very well done. Yeah, it's like they make him that way on purpose. Like he's supposed to be the Tyrant King, but he cares so much for his people. He Mm -hmm. just wants better. And it's, it's more about him learning throughout the course of the show, especially, you know, finding out exactly where he came from, mm-hmm. uh, who he is, and, you know, his connection with the Shoe Gods. Because at the end of the show, the Shoe Gods, their souls are still with Yanma, and Kuwagon is still within uh, Gira. Mm-hmm. And so their bodies can be reconstructed, even after they burned up fighting Dig Dug. Mm-hmm. But with Gira himself, it's so interesting to see that character, especially how he is so much more bombastic. 
uh, before the time skip when he ends up, you know, he matures a lot mm-hmm. throughout the second part. He actually gets a brain blast at the end when he figures out exactly what Raynal wanted. Unlike the other time where he tried to get a brain blast and failed. <laughs> they legitimately went into his brain and saw him connecting the dots and then he didn't get it. <laughs> that was multiple times. That's funny, man. It I is like, funny. Oh, they finally they paid it off. <laughs> He's a great character. He's a he's a great character. He's a great leader. The way they use the Red Ranger as the wild card, I think, is very well done. In a it's, different way than Damo Mataro's. Yeah. Because yeah. Damo Mataro's was Damo Mataro was a deconstruction of the overpowered hero. And I think Brigham Lee done there as well. But yeah. this is this is more like the Red Ranger as the wild card, as the outsider coming into a group that is already somewhat there. Because you have the Alliance of Kings, you have the different countries, but then he comes in and it's like everything is turned on its head and suddenly our heroes are learning things about each other they never knew before and they're really growing to care for each other as both kings and as friends as it goes along. Be- yeah. All because like he showed up and is like making them rethink the way everything is happening. Uh, I don't want to go directly on to Yama. I actually want to go on, stay in the family and go on to Reckless. Yeah, let's do it. An amazing character. My God. They set up so much with him. Mm. And the things that he does over the course of this show. From being the tyrant. Being legitimately the bad guy. At the beginning of the show. To showing exactly why he did. What he did in episode 41. So we can get back and protect the people. Protect as many people as he can. Save as many people as he can. Mm. From this cosmic horror. That he legitimately can't do anything against. Until he tricks everybody mm-hmm. into giving him that power to strike down this man being. It's he's just so I couldn't believe it <laughs> when they did when they did the heel turn as well as they did. Because it wasn't completely shadowed, but you could sort of feel like it was coming. Mm-hmm. And in Rackley's case, the payoff. Mm-hmm. To coming back from the dead and anticipating everybody's move, playing 15D chess while everybody else was playing Go Fish. Go Fish. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like that sometimes, yeah, especially were... after the big reveal. He, everybody else was playing Go Fish. He was playing I Declare a War. <laughs> it was crazy. Just what they did with this character. I. It was fantastic. Mm. And the way it was shot, the the sheer amount of emotion that you can get when he's, you know, feeding this thing to, well, when his father was feeding this thing to his brother, because mm-hmm. he didn't want to do that. Yeah. So he had to get his brother out of there to save him. And the emotional turmoil that he ends up going into that. You can see it when there's like the kid version of him playing and uh, Dick Dug is just like using him as a stepping stool. I, I want to bring that up too, because... Thinking about the flashbacks, because you see, like, prior to the whole reveal, you do see some flashbacks of young Gira and young Rackless, and they seem to have a pretty good relationship, and I'm wondering, like, what happened to you that made you so corrupted? What made you evil? And when they finally reveal it, and they recontextualize everything that has happened since, and they go on to show you more flashbacks, that Rackless was a good older brother. He was a good other brother, older brother. He loved Gira. And a good husband. Yeah. To Susan. Oh, my goodness. We need to talk about this relationship because it's great. I wasn't This is another thing about the about the face turn that really makes that really recontextualizes everything because it's like when we first meet Suzume and she's like head over heels for Rakle-sama and uh we find out about, you know, she's her her brother is Kagaragi blah blah blah, blah and the way she's acting, but it's like, oh, okay, so I guess she's putting up a facade that she loves Rackless. This is what this is. Yeah, I'm talking about, about my own thought process. Like, okay, so she's no, putting up a thought. facade of that she loves Rackless. So, but she's like, you know, secretly feeding information to Kagaragi when she can. But like, after Rackless, you know, dies, quote unquote, and she still is keeping up appearances. And then when he comes back and she's like right by his side again, it's like, is there something more going on here? Like, does which, she does she truly love this guy? Which it's sort of it's really layered with her because mm-hmm. she's sort of doing both, you know, giving Kagaragi information, 
uh, helping Reckless when she can, especially when she ends up finding out the entire thing with Dig Dug. Uh, and working to really make sure that the facade is kept up mm. to get that betrayal of him later on um, and that everything works. She'll stand by him no matter what. And it's just like, oh, she's been brainwashed. Nope. nope. She's there. One, because she does love the guy. But two, because she she, genu- knows, she genuinely loves Reckless and she genuinely loves her brother. <laughs> and she also she understands the gravitas of the situation. Yeah. What she has to do. She knows what's at stake. Yeah. Uh, and just all the reactions, like after afterwards when he's like in that little cage in various countries throughout the, throughout the latter half of the show. And also he has when he when she's like in the cage with him and just like making him lunch and just like being really lovey dovey. It's just so cute. Somebody's castle. It's a game show. Somebody's castle. Takashi's castle. Takashi's castle. When they're doing the thing with like the hammer and the ball on top of the head he's making the faces like the guy oh <laughs> interesting he's like uh what was it Jeremy out <laughs> that was really funny that 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 whole thing but I want to talk briefly about that episode with the moment where Kagaragi's face on the balloon and it keeps changing it's like mom boom, dad boom, Sebastian no, Sebastian, no, Sebastian, Sebastian Sebastian without Sebastian. makeup Fat Sebastian, Kunk. The, the Sebastian thing was that maturity because she almost didn't do it on the first two. And then she just went. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just wouldn't move. And then we'll get to, we'll get to Kakarot in a second. Yeah. He's, he's just amazing. But yeah, Rackley's that entire thing. And then at the end of the show, he decides to, well, one, he has to stay a prisoner. Yeah. Susan May's still there with him. And yeah. they're, they're working to rebuild everything. Mm-hmm. Like physical labor and all. Rebuild, rotate him, and he's got a loving wife who will dote upon him every second of every day. So even though he's still, you know, paying his dues through his community service, he's still, you know, there's still there's still something there for him. Yanma. Yanma Gast. He doesn't get as much in terms of, like, the past. We end up seeing, uh, one, um, he ends up taking over from the previous uh, king. He ends up fighting Doggy Kruger. <laughs> At one point, the guy, like the gangster, Came is with- Doggy Kruger's voice actor with the s and pup hood on his shoulder. Oh, that's cool. He ends up coming back at the end of the show, too, to fight. Like, all the prisoners and everybody are fighting mm-hmm. at the uh, end of the show. It's great. Yep. But, yeah, it's just Tombo himself, I think he has the least, but that's because he's really looking forward to the future. So he doesn't dwell as much on his past. So we don't get to see as much of his past. Mm. We get to see how he meet uh, he meets Shirokara. We we see enough because yeah. we know he was because and, and Kosaba is very very cyberpunk. He he was in the slums, like in the junkyards, learning from you know some random guy, and just built his computer from scratch. And through you know sheer two fisted grit and determination, rose to the rank of King. president of Inkopasa. King. King, but they do call him president. But I think that actually kind of works because it's it's a cyberpunk, you know, land where the corporations are the ones in charge. So, like, calling him president, I think, makes more sense. Yeah. For this, for this it one. It really works for him. Like, he might not have as much to do with the past, mm-hmm. but he's so, t- like, technologically inclined. He's the one who really comes up with things for the future. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, like he, they, he's the wise king. Yeah. Because I like, we only get the... I am so and so, you know, something red. We we only get that like two or three times. It feels like throughout this entire show. Once is in episode fifty. Yeah, and the episode fifty, the out of suit roll call that happens in that when we have ever it. It's not just I'm this ha. It's like they get everyone gets a monologue as they walk towards the camera. With their attendants and all the citizens of their country behind them. And then they say, and they don't say Kuogata Ojer. It's like Girahasti. I am king of Shugudam Girahasti. I am president of Inkosapa uh, Inkos, Yan Magast. And it's th- it's their names. We're telling you our names, who we are, not what color do I wear when I Transform. I think the only time they do that is in the Kyori Uja crossover. Do they say their... They don't say their colors. They do say the... Yeah, they say like Kuwakata Uja. Yeah, they do that in the first half too. They do it once. 
It literally only happens three times, and I'm just like, yes. It feels like that. Yes. I don't know. I don't know exactly how many. This is this is this is this is good. Mm-hmm. It is good. <laughs> I really, really appreciate just what Yama brought because he was the future guy. Yeah, it is like everybody else was really you know about their past and everything. He's like, no, I have a future with all these people that I had to protect. Yeah, uh, he people that he has to protect. His relationship with Gira as well, and and Shiokara, mm-hmm. just how close they are to each other. And, you know, how close he is to his people. Um, You know, the hero bidder basically ended up tearing down and and Kosovo is like, we can rebuild. And so they do. Yeah. Him and Odan. Ah. First impressions of her were not the strongest. Did not like her at all at first. But as the show goes on, yeah. She, like everybody else in the show, is peak. Yeah. So... (laughs) Everything with their parents. Using my own selfishness as a way to... Blowing up that person's house in the beginning. Yeah. On phone to give them a better house. But yeah, she had already paid for and built a better house for them. But, you know, this one was kind of old and ratchety. It was in the way of the view of the flowers. So, eh, we'll build you something new. It's just so good. Mm-hmm. She's really good. And also, the end of that episode with the, um, with the dad. The dad of the girl who was in the wheelchair. Oh, yeah. When... Because, like, he, he was, like, very angry with Himeno, you know, calling her selfish and spoiled and whatnot and so on and so forth. But the end of that episode where I think it's Sebastian goes up to him and is like, well, the queen's dress was dirtied in the scuffle. Would you mind repairing it? And he gets, like, a job as, a, as like, the queen's dressmaker. So, like, it's, like, it's that selfishness of, like, you are repairing this dress for me, but in doing so, I give you a job. Your house is blocking my view but I'm going to give you another one. Also, she possibly had, like, some of the, I guess, some of the best, like, one-off moments. Because she was the angriest out of everybody. Everything, especially with Glody. Uh, everything that happened with yeah. her parents. Yeah. How, how really upset she was with Jeremy at the beginning when she thought it was him. Yeah. Um, yeah, she was a really good character throughout. How protective show. she was of Rita. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> the episode where Rita, they are... Contem- they are about to use their frost ability to seal themselves and whoever the bad guy was. For- it might have been Glody. Whoever the bad guy was for that episode in Ice. And Jimeno embracing them and saying, No, you're too precious. You can't, do- you can't throw your life away like that. We'll, we'll help you get through this. The shippers were crazy in this show. It was only a ship between... Why am I not surprised? It was only a ship between Rita... And Himino, or Rita and Morphonia, or Rita and Malfoy. But <laughs> those are like, that was it. The guys don't matter. <laughs> and I was like, I sort of love that. It's like, go. Oh, well. Yeah, Himino, Himino is a great character. She was so, so good. The further the, sh- the show went along, the more depth that she got. And man, did she, like, like she, as you said, she came around for you. She. She sold me pretty much at the beginning, mm-hmm. but like as soon as Glody got revealed and everything along with him and everything with the fury of the gods and everything that you know she lost in particular, yeah. she was just so rightfully angry. She was willing to use a weapon that was just the antithesis of her and just kill him. There's um in, in that group hug that I talked about, the moment after they stop Wrath of God Part 2. After they stop that, this is great because uh, it's like Gira and uh, Yanma, like they kind of embrace and then Yama like reaches over, grabs her, and pulls her over. There's a there's a great moment, a little like acting moment that she does, where it I think shows how much how far she's come as a character and also how much she cares about these people. Yeah. When he pulls her in, she's kind of like, what at first, but then she just kind of she just like immediately softens up and smiles. And she's just like so happy to be embraced by these people. And I love that. So yeah. That uh episode between her uh the body swap episode. With her and Kakaragi just being the complete another opposite. It was perfect. It was so good. It was perfect. So good. It seeing, was the best body swap episode they've ever seeing done. Seeing her act mm-hmm. like him was the funniest thing. <laughs> All right. Who's next? We got to talk about... Well, we should have talked about Sebastian just a little bit here. Um, he was like, oh, everybody really wanted me. He was like, well, we could fix that. So they give him a makeover to make him look old. He was, he was, he was too hot. That Sebastian's problem is he was too hot and people fainted at the sight of him and he wanted to take his own life to rid himself the world of the blight he was causing because of his hotness. And he was like, and no. And he was like, slap, no. We make you up and make you look like old man instead. And now you butler. And now Enjoy. you butler. 
Yeah. I like Sebastian a lot, though. Sebastian's really good. He was a really good character. All the attendants. I mean, like, Doga. Great honorable... Doga. Honorable man. And you got uh, Shirakara's got some great energy there. He has a lot of energy, Jesus. Sebastian's great. We'll talk about the other one in a second, because yeah. now we're going to go ahead and switch over to Rita. Rita. R- Rita Kaniska. Judge. Jury and executioner. In some cases. Or executioner. <laughs> that too. Execution I... One, it's great to have a non-binary character just be really at the forefront, and that's who they are. Mm. Uh, it's not anything that, you know, it's being pushed it's really working well to the story it's a part of just who they are and role that they play in the story yeah again like the judge has to be completely impartial. neutral and impartial so removing the like re- completely removing yourself from the construct of gender it's a it's a pretty fascinating story idea i like how it was used and rita having a great relationship with their parents uh th- nothing is wrong with their parents people just kept assuming something was wrong during the idol episode and they were like no Jesus Christ, I was getting information. You people suck. <laughs> At the end, it all turns out to be a god, and they're so mad. You've ruined everything. <laughs> I love Rita so much. Just a standout character. Mm. Just the most stoic, honestly hilarious, so good. Ugh. I don't even really know what to say. Just, like Just Rita, adjectives and superlatives all around. That's, that's really what Rita is. It's like Rita has some of the greatest moments just as a judge. And dealing with everything with Kardas. And- <laughs> There's this great moment with her, with them and Kagaragi, when it's after Kagaragi has snuck in to uh, replace the lances. And he, oh. and he mentions this to, to, to the team. And Rita, they just go, you snuck in, stand trial. <laughs> well, the, the moment before that is also really funny. Because Rita's like walking to uh, like past them. And they're dressed as soldiers. And they just grab them really quickly. And Rita's like, oh. <laughs> What's happening? What's going on? What, what, what? <laughs> but uh, um, Rita's such a good character. The the Mofun stuff I thought was really well used. Yes, their room, the, the final shot of them in their room at the in the last episode, sleep. where they're just asleep under a giant stuffed animal. It's the cutest thing, and I'm like, yes, and I was like, get the rest you deserve, my serious, judge. I wish I was Rita in that situation. <laughs> yeah, that looks really cozy. Uh, Morphonia. And Morphonia. I love Morphonia. It's just an antithesis to Rita. Being so chill about everything. So but chill, but also very... Bitch. But also... Yes, very much so. The... I want to talk briefly about the movie. The end of the... The post credit scene of the movie where they show you how everyone died with the lie detector. Because, <laughs> uh, um... What's his name? Shirakara puts it on. He's like, Yeah, my God, sucks! And... Psh! And Sebastian puts it on... Uh, what, he says something like, he's like, Himeno was really ugly, but then, like, nothing happens, and he's like, huh? huh? And then he gets zapped. But then we get to Morphonia, and she's like, gee, I really love working. <laughs> like, she doesn't even finish her sentence! She doesn't even finish well, her sentence and get zapped! That was how they got every back from everybody. Pink comedy! Back. That's how Pink they got comedy! Everybody back from Hakabaka. Using the delay with Sebastian and then not even letting her finish. Peak. I love it. The timing was brilliant. Uh, Morphonia, just wonderfully used. Um, great costume design. Great, really great, great actress. I love the fact that for all the attendants, except Curl, but I think that was just because of the fact that he had no face. Um, they really, but went, he has the orange. Yeah, they really went into their backstories. Like they're they're legitimately fleshed out characters, mm. not just through the lens of oh you get to see them as just the attendants. Like no, they are their own person, mm. and I really appreciated what they did. I mean, even even Kuro is because because he has like the he is visually distinct from everyone else. The way they I think the way they use him is appropriate enough. Sure, he's the least fleshed out of the bunch, but I still like I I love when you hear him speak for the first time. They're like. Uh- and Gira's like, oh, I love your voice. He's like, why, thank you. Because he has like a because he's not voiced by the same actor who was him on set. No. It's a different actor, but but it's still but it's still like a nice touch to give him like a booming resonant voice. It's so good. And he's been so quiet up to this point. Yeah. Kaguragi Dibolski. The Lord of Schemes. Mm. He's the greatest character in this show. Everybody's you the greatest th- character. So I was like, really? You think he is? Everybody's <laughs> the greatest character. They're just all the greatest characters. They're all the greatest. But Kagaragi... Just but they're all great in their own ways. And yeah. Kagaragi... The fact that when you first meet him, it's... For those first couple episodes where 
it's so hard to get a read on him. Yeah. Because he's always scheming, because he's always... He is always putting up this front of theatrical showmanship and grand presentation. I am Kogorogi Jimowski, king of tofu, on the law. And it's like, that's him all the time, regardless of if he's telling the truth or not. And his backstory is still my favorite thing. It's a great backstory. It's him and everything with uh, mm. Iroki and the burning of the castle. It's just, it's so well done. Mm. And I love that it was just such an antithesis because he didn't want to cut Iroki down. Yeah. And when he comes outside, people just assume what happened. They assume that he overthrew an evil king. Yeah, evil queen in this case. Evil queen, yeah. And, like, he just doesn't tell anybody the truth. Mm-hmm. And that's basically the lie that he consistently is telling himself, which is why he to be doing anything that she does, like tries to whisper in his ear, doesn't work. That is what caused her to get body slammed. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Kobe he's Ricky. so good. Uh, I loved his actor. He has a twin. How does he? Yes, he has a twin brother. Um, That's right, because I I, I read on the uh, little behind the scenes of the wiki that he used to watch Die Ranger. Yeah, with with his twin brother and his and also his younger sister, I mm-hmm. believe. And he and his brother would always argue about who had to be the Red Ranger. And it's funny because Die Ranger has a twin in it. I want to see the twins get together. Mm. Just take a picture with the yellow <laughs> from Die Ranger and the blue from um that one Metal Hero season. One of the beat seasons. I believe it's the first one. Mm. And then Kagaraki and his brother. I just want a picture. <laughs> Give us a picture. Do it to Gentlemen of Verona. <laughs> yeah, I, I just literally want a picture of... I think of, that's the Shakespeare play with the twins. Of the four of them. That's all I want. And who knows? It might end up happening. Because I know uh, uh, Shoji's actor, Tenma Ranger, uh, watched the show as well. Oh, cool. So he, he and you know he's obviously friends with uh, Kaz's actor, and I guess his brother as well. Mm. They're just like, Let, let's just I want a picture. That's all the one. Ah, Jeremy. Jeremy is. I said it earlier. I will say it again because it bears repeating. He's the best Six Ranger ever. No other Six Ranger has ever come close to being this well integrated into the story, this well characterized. This integral to the plot and the other characters and really feeling like a member of the team than Jeremy Brassier. He was great. Yeah. I loved his story of taking over after uh, I, I Ezra. Ha- yes. I have to mention, the. I, I said this before, I will say it again, the casting, especially in an ensemble piece like this, you know, your product will live and die on that. And everyone is so perfectly cast. Like, nobody misses a beat, no matter how big or small their role is. Jeremy's actor in particular, he has the the makeup, the hair, the costume, the way everything comes together, he has such an interesting face. Yeah, he's he, beautiful. He is very beautiful, but also his eyes. The way the actor is able to utilize his eyes, even if he's looking directly at you, he looks like he could be looking a thousand yards into the distance at something else. It's just so fantastic. It's it's such a good and casting the, choice. The way that he tried to make changes to, you know, the Bugnarok and then mm-hmm. Hidobidu coming in and basically making him out to be the bad guy at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. It was just... Or a, bo- a burden that he sh- chose to shoulder himself. Yeah, he's just... It's so well done. Mm-hmm. And especially with him and Ghetto Jim uh, also being a good boy. Ah, uh, Ghetto Jim. Um... <laughs> I love, well, I'll talk about the second one with Jeremy Jeff because I do want to talk about him too. But Jeremy just himself is such an, a breath of fresh air. Like you said, he's so integral and uh, purposeful to the story. Mm-hmm. He's, he's the reason a lot of the story happens. Mm-hmm. And he's just, it's so unbelievably good. In so, just how it's done. In so many other Sentai, the, it six, could, Ranger the six Ranger, when they come in, even no, no matter how good they are, which you know there've been plenty of good ones, plenty of bad ones, but they always do f- feel like the outsider up to the end of the show. They always they always feel like it's like we have our heroes, and then we also have this person. Like th- they come in and like they are always still in that sixth ranger status. They never quite feel like they have completely gelled with and meshed with the team. 
Jeremy complete, completely turns that on its head. It's so funny coming from Don Torvald. For, like, after he... After he comes in, and after the whole, like, time skip and everything, like, he truly feels like one of the family. Yeah. he Like, every time he's there, it never feels like, oh, and the Six Ranger is here. It's like, no, he's he's one of the main cast, and he deserves a place there as much as anyone. One of the things that he was really worried about throughout the place of the show, because he was going to live so much longer than everybody else, because of the King's Crest inside of him. Mm-hmm. And now he doesn't have to. And I think that's something that he really wanted. Mm-hmm. He wanted to be able to grow old with... The rest of the King Oders. Yeah. Ghetto Jim Ghetto is Jim. good boy. Good. He is the reason He's that... good boy. He's best boy. ...that the trick worked at the end. He took the place of King Caucasus Kabuto. Mm. So that point where he drops out of the sky mm-hmm. and beats the shit out of Resurrected Glody and Kame Jim, that's why. That fake King Caucasus Kabuto blew up. It was mm. Ghetto Jim. Mm-hmm. He came down and just beat everybody ass. Yep. I am He's, a Mayfly. I am everywhere and nowhere. He was an unintentionally amazing character because he was supposed, like, he died at the beginning of the show. He was just presented as just another monster of the week. But then he came in and was really integral to the story itself and, you know, keeping Jeremy sort of grounded throughout uh, this entire thing. I, I just love what they did with him and it was so unintentional. Well, I'm not going to say unintentional, but it didn't feel like the most intentional thing. But I love when a character sort of just ends up taking really on a life of their own. Gerojin was great. I mm. really loved him. Mm. Uh, we'll talk about the gestures here. We sort of already talked about Desnarok and what he really did to the story. Yeah. Uh, Go- Goma didn't really get as much to do. Mm. He sort of came in. He was comedic. He was the side guy in Rita's uh, Idol episode. So that yep. was fun. Um, and then he died after he got tricked. Yep. Hidibidu brought us one of the best episodes of the show in episode 29. Mm. When, uh, you know, the whole clapping scene and then the beating her ass. Because <laughs> she deserved it. Mm. She deserved all the pain. Um, they do a great job of making you hate these villains. Yeah. The way they are, in the ways that they're evil, in the ways that they're like smug and obnoxious, especially in the funny. ways they use their powers, I would say especially Hirobiro and um, Dagdad. I think, because mo- more than ever, you, you look at it, I mean, we look back at Death and Rock. We look back at him, and immediately we like we get what his deal is. Yeah, he shows up. He's underground. There's fire. There's armies of minions, and his advisor is next to him. And he's like, "Ah, the prophecy will come, and we shall destroy the Sephas." Ah, it's like okay, we kind of know what we're in for for this guy. And the, then we didn't. The je- and then we didn't. They you know they turned that on its head. But with the jesters, with Dagnan's introduction, and with everyone else. With their actions and the way they are played and written, they instantly are hateable. It's not just like, it's not like you see Death and Rock and it's like, okay, he's a bad guy. We want our heroes to triumph against him because otherwise he'll blow up all their stuff. With these guys, it's like, they show up and you're like, oh, these people gotta die because I just don't like them. They they're they're awful. Sitting on the thrones of the kings. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's just like, they have to get them off of there, which is why Rita ends up being the best character, because they're the only one who ends up landing any true hits. On the <laughs> uh, what? When Gira and Jeremy are fighting his dagger the first time, he's like checking his nails. And I'm sitting here like, I appreciate that, sis. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when they're like hitting him, because none of their attacks work. None of their attacks work, and Dag did... Just that introduction of just him being so smug and so high and mighty, just teleporting all over the place and just just toying with Gira. And immediately you're like, this this guy gotta go. And this then, guy gotta go. You have Grody and Kamijim who have just had so many actions that have affected the past mm-hmm. of the King Orders with the Wrath of uh, Wrath of the Gods, Kamijim being there since the beginning with uh, the Bugnarok, and Grody being a previous uh, Brother Wright that was brought back to life to, you know, bring it back to straight up death mm. to everybody. Um, it's just so wild just how well integrated they've made pretty much everybody into the story. And at least McNonan had a point where he was basically uh, a respawn point for Dagnet. Yep. This show is amazing. Yeah. I don't know. If I could put anything in like a number one spot right now, 
Mostly because of the fact that Don Brothers sort of does hold that spot. It's like Don Brothers, Decker Ranger, Die Ranger, Lightman, and Change Man. I might have to put like 1A, 1B like they did with Lupat and just put King Ojo. Like I said, they're both incredible. It's just they're incredible for different reasons. Yeah. It's so difficult putting them just like... It's technically a top six, but we have two occupying number one for me. Fair enough. Don Brothers for it being Don Brothers and getting mm-hmm. the King Ojo just killed. <laughs> because I can't wait to see how this movie's gonna be. Oh, and boy. King Ojo just being like on a whole other scale. I don't know how to quantify it. And I think that's sort of the Like I said, thing. it's press this is the first time we've ever had prestige television from yeah. Toku. So again, like the the bar has been raised for many th- over the past like four years in Sentai, the bar has been raised. And the onus is on Boom Boom. Boom Boom t- and also Every other Toku, because because even then, like we had Geats, we had Blazer, we've had things be elevated to like new heights in all on all the major ones. It's like I I don't want Boom Boonger to try and go the same route that this did. I want it to be something more normal. It's only something to bring us back down to earth. Literally in this case, because we just had taken top of girl and gone. But <laughs> I, I want Boom Boonger to be a little bit more. I I guess. I'm I'm ready. I'm good for another more standard fare right now because I just came off of this. I don't think I can take but, two but, of these but as we saw with Kira Major, you can be as like borderline good versus evil, back to basics as you. I know you feel just. I'm I'm just talking about for me personally. You can go as back to basics as you can, but you can still elevate it with that quality of acting, writing, and whatnot, which brings me to a little something I like more than anything. What I want to see, I would love to see a behind-the-scenes documentary about the production of King Odor from start to finish. That'd be fun. Because I'm curious as to, like, like from Genesis to the final day of shooting. They have, a, a like, a TikTok complication, complication on the Sentai Reddit uh-huh. of, like, everything from day one to now. Well, that's cool. It's, like, a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff. So, but, but even going back further than that to, like, the inception of the production, like... I'm wondering, like, because this is so radically different than anything we've gotten before, and because of the heights at which it elevates itself to, did the writer, like, find out what, like, did they, do they decide on the theme first? Like, okay, we're going to do, like, Bugs oh, like, and Kings. Like and what Bandai Is it going to be, like, Bugs and Kings, and then, like, does the writer come to them and be like, I've got a take for this? Or is it, like, pitch us your ideas, what, what do you have? But either way, it's like, this was the end result, and the end result is fantastic. This is unbelievable. This was, this was the one show, just like, I didn't, I haven't watched Gotch Art since we did our first impressions, but. Yeah, me either. With Geats, Dawn Brothers, and this, and Zenkaiser as well, it's just like. Every Blazer as well. Week, yeah, and Blazer, it's just like, every single week, I, I was up. I'm ready. Like, let's go. I'm ready to see exactly what they're going to bring me. Mm. And these, the past couple, the last couple weeks of King Oger were so hard. <laughs> because he had to wait. Yeah. But that, like, that anticipation was just, and being there in the community, just really being there with everybody. And having that anticipation for each new episode was crazy. And it's been that way since Zenkaiger for me. Uh, since I've really just, like, really got into uh, speaking to people on a really much more daily basis about uh, the shows. Every single week, we were just waiting for the next episode of a new Sentai, and I can't believe it. Mm. Because I was there for a little bit with Ryu Soldier, um, and that wasn't great. But ever since... Yikes. <laughs> ever since Zenkai, has just been like, every single week, we're ready. Let's go. What what weirdness is Zenkai you're going to bring us? What weirdness is Don Brothers going to bring us? What epic is King Ojo going to do next? What? And what now we we're just waiting to see what is Boon Boonger going to bring us in general. Yeah. We're... I'm excited for it. I hope it's good. I am too. As I, do with all, as I do with all shows. We'll be out in a couple weeks for the first three. Mm-hmm. Um, next up, though, uh, we filmed a thing before this, which was the 520th anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> we had to do that first because we would have had no energy because I'm getting there. My voice would have been gone. Yeah. Um, and then after that, we're actually doing something good with Ultraman. Yes. The original. The original Ultraman. We're not going to start with Ultra Q. I don't think I could do that. But uh, maybe we'll go back and do it at some point. Yeah, not we, right did, now. we did do Neo Ultra Q. Yeah, that'll hold you over. <laughs> but uh, yeah, let us know what you thought. But about I think that'll do it. Yeah. Let us know what you Ooh. thought about King Ojo in the comments below. 
Uh, in the meantime, uh, holy Moses. This is our longest review. I don't know if it's our longest, but it's up it there. Is. It is? Yep. Gaim was our longest one before this, and that was just over two. We're almost at two and a half. <laughs> you did call it. But, uh, he's got some editing to do. I've got Final Fantasy VII Rebirth to go back and play. And then you'll be doing whatever for the rest of the day, I assume. Not a damn thing. This is taking all the energy out of me. There you go. <laughs> But in the meantime, thank you all very much for watching, and we will see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.